They definitely grew up playing outside, enjoying nature, sailing, on the water, Lake Michigan. But I lived in a big house, and I had a lot of stuff in that house. So living aboard a boat is a little bit, is a lot different from how I grew up. I don't miss a thing. I don't miss a thing. We had a, we had a house fire in my parents' house years ago. All of my personal belongings were at home. Everything was there, and a lot of things were lost or damaged. And um, I don't miss any of it. I didn't miss a thing. It was almost like a burden lifted off my shoulders. It was like, I don't need these things. It's more fun without them, less to organize and clean. <laughs> Why do I live on a boat? Well, I live on a boat because because the scenery is always changing. I mean, I could live in a really small apartment, but the scenery wouldn't change. It's not confining. Even though like my cabin is wicked small, it's like the size of a small closet, it's not confining because I have a horizon everywhere and so much open space. We're, oh, wait a minute, where are we? We're in um, Atlantic City. Atlantic City, New Jersey. A little rainy out there. It's rainy and stormy, and there's a storm coming, so we're staying here for two days and we're making a big breakfast feast. Even if you're at anchor for months, which I've done that, <laughs> the weather changes and it's fun. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> this is good breakfast, and this is a good idea. I think it's aesthetically beautiful. It's co so cozy and the practicality of it is beautiful too. I'm gonna give you a tour of the sailing vessel Daphne. Um, this is the galley, which is the kitchen. This is my refrigerator, my icebox here. Dory likes almond milk. Come here, Dory. It's easier just dealing with something that's so small and contained than managing so much more. We have a sink. We've got a two burner stove under here. The head right here. Dory's litter box. And this is the saloon. This is where I sit for lunch, and that's it. That's the entire boat. When I first started downsizing, I thought, someday I'm gonna live on a boat. And so I thought I would only keep as much stuff as could fit in my car. I put a few boxes in storage at my parents, but the rest of it I moved aboard my boat. And the rest of it I gave away. I, I, took, I would take carloads full of it to Goodwill. Stuff that I thought was really nice, I gifted to friends. And then expensive items like cameras and stuff, I sold on eBay. Well, I also live on a boat because I want to own a boat. And I can't really afford to own a boat and, and not. So I chose the boat. I moved aboard so that I could have adventures and travel. a squall line and the boat won't stop rocking back and forth. And I'm trying to sleep. It's pretty windy and the waves are pretty big. I'm taking on water in the cockpit. So I'm trying, trying to get some rest. I'm really conscious of what I bring aboard Daphne because, well, usually it has to fit in a backpack because that's how I get it aboard Daphne because I have to row out to the boat. And um, it's got to be small. Daphne's small. <laughs> when I sailed down from Martha's Vineyard to Florida, I stopped at Anchorage a lot. So I would hitch a ride into town or bike. I have a folding bike aboard. I would bike to go to the grocery store or walk. My refrigerator is under here. I don't have a freezer. I don't carry any meat. Daphne's a vegetarian boat. So I pack anything that I can find in a grocery store, but I have to plan for longer durations because I can't always get to a grocery store. I can only carry so much food in my backpack. When I get to the grocery stores, I pack the, the stuff that lasts the longest in the bottom of the refrigerator. The eggs, the cheese, the green tomatoes, the carrots. I think the green apples last the longest. I have a bunch of oranges left. This broccoli is starting to go bad, so I'm going to have to eat that next. And definitely, if you're planning for a long trip, buy green tomatoes that are perfectly round. This one used to be green, and it's ready to ripe and ready to eat. And I have food hiding in about every corner of this boat. 
and they're stored all over my boat. I have lockers in the sole of the boat. I have there's st food stored on the shelves, food stored underneath the seats, all over the place. It's kind of fun finding food months later that I forgot was there. What are you doing? I'm testing the chips to see if they taste like diesel. Why would they taste like diesel? Because you stored them near the engine room. Because <laughs> the cereal tasted like diesel. Yep. Well, we have to see what else is stored down here. Because there's other food down there. If it tastes like diesel, don't give it to Dory. I have a propane, a two burner propane stove. I make one pot meals because there's really no counter space aboard Daphne. Actually, the only counter space is there's a board that goes over the two burner stove. So when I'm not using the stove, I can have a counter. Yeah, taking out the trash. Well, you have, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, stop right there. Which trash bag is yours, Benji? Which trash bag is mine? <laughs> yeah, but who emptied yours the other day and I did not? I mean, I don't produce much trash because I can't bring in much stuff aboard the boat. There's not room to create a lot of trash. I find when I'm living ashore, I create a lot more trash. There's no accumulation of things. If I buy something new, something old has got to go. <laughs> Well, and it, I don't accumulate things, too, because it's just a nuisance to have too much stuff aboard a small space. Because I start to not be able to find things, things pile up on top of each other, they get buried deep in lockers, and I can't find anything. So, when there's more open space in my tiny little space, then I can find things and use things better. So, when it comes down to it, I just choose the things to have aboard that I really need, or really like and want. So, I find that balance of needs and wants, and that's, that's all I bring aboard. It's not the small place that I found peace of mind, not like the size of the boat, but just how much more... It, it's almost like I lived a bigger life because I lived in such a small place, because the focus wasn't inside the walls of my apartment or inside the walls of my boat. I had the whole... It was like I had the whole ocean. They're playing with Daphne! It was more of like an open feeling of life because my life didn't exist in just that small space. It exists in so much more space than that. And at the times when I live in a house or apartment or something, it's a lot easier to just keep your life at your home, at your job, and that sort of thing. It's not like that for me living on a boat. People always say, oh, I could never live like that. But uh, it's not true. I think people are more capable of living in with less comfort and in more challenging situations than, than they do. There's Benji back there. Yes, everyone can live with less than they have. And everyone can live in small spaces. I think they can. I don't think everyone can live on a boat. There's a lot of work involved in living on a boat and a lot of know-how. But could people live in a small cabin? Yes. Could they learn to fend for themselves? Could they learn to fix things and manage things in a different way? Absolutely. And would they be happy there? I think the more you have, the more you want. So um, when you reduce, you want less, and so you're happy with what you have. If you have more, you want more, and you're never satisfied, at least in my experience. So I think that people would surprise themselves and be happy. Financial independence, country shopping, Van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host Shane and Kyle as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vonning. You're listening to the Vonning Podcast. And welcome to the Vonning Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm Shane and... Of Kyle. Since governments are the primary coercers upon individuals, the Vanu podcast is covered by Bibcot No Government License. Reuse and modification is permitted to anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can learn more at bipcot.org. All right, very good. So, first off, uh, the clip you heard at the beginning of this episode uh, is uh, a walkthrough of Teresa Carey's life on a boat. 
Now, obviously, uh, some of that, when she's giving you a tour of her boat, it's not really conducive to a video-less podcast. Uh, but the point is that many folks are doing this already, uh, this being one example. And for those of you who, are long, who are listened to my other podcast, you heard that when we discussed Vanu uh, as part of the Direct Action series. But I'll be sure to uh, put a link in the show notes for you to uh, for for you to check out her situation, or just you know go to YouTube and type in, uh, you know, uh, living aboard a boat. There's so many examples of it. I mean, you have some of the smaller boats, then you have some of the folks in yachts with, uh, which I'll talk about here in a moment, the very expensive satellite internet packages and all of that. You know, where they they've got money to spend, and then they're 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 doing it right. Uh, they're doing it well. Uh, but yeah, there, there's a lot of uh, a lot of different examples up there on YouTube. I'd highly suggest uh, you you check those out. But uh, Kyle, what's new, man? I have reason to believe I've discovered an ethical enclave, or at the very least, uh, some gray market activity. Um, but yeah, let me let me put it this way: um, in in the attempt to pursue at least some degree of financial independence by working two jobs, uh, one of them uh, apparently on some days of the week, depending on whether either the inventory got screwed up or due to some other reasons. Uh, there will be a batch of usually perishable food products that will be uh, labeled as donations. And of course, the uh, warehouse employees get first picks as to <laughs> uh, what what food they want to take home. And uh, because some of the products are arguably considered yuppie food, um, it was interesting. My best friend actually was kind of double checking the prices of some of the of some of the hauls I've been able to make lately, and it looks like it. Uh, my more conservative hauls equaled my base pay for like one of my shifts, and usually it's about uh, double. One time it was even triple my base pay in terms of uh, the yuppie food. So that. Uh, uh, <laughs> the 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 ferns that I've been earning can now be reallocated towards other things that I've been kind of holding off and holding off on for the longest time because now I don't have to put those towards uh, the grocery bill because essentially right. I'm getting the equivalent of free groceries. So, that yeah, so, so instead of dumpster diving, you're just you know getting free food at work. Oh, uh, this is well well this is a cleaner version of dumpster diving. Although in principle it's still kind of the same thing. Except it's not available to the general public, kind of like how a dumpster is, right? Um, but yeah, so whatever the employees don't get on the first batch, then it goes to like a local food pantry or, or like homeless people type stuff or whatever else. Uh, but yeah, that's been kind of interesting because apparently not all the employees know about it. Uh, definitely not the newer people. In fact, it's only been the older employees who've worked there like uh, over a year. That actually kind of gradually kind of showed me that there is such a thing as donation. So yeah, pretty much on each one of my shifts, I just asked the acting manager on duty, hey, is there anything in donations this shift? And generally speaking, there always is. So that's been an interesting way of, of, of discovering completely by accident a gray market within my otherwise white market job. Right, right. Huh, interesting, interesting. So that would that would be the the things that uh, you were, were expired by like a week or something or yeah, or usually. things where, you know, like a package might be dented or something where they can't actually uh, sell it. Is that kind of what you're what you're getting at Exa here? Yeah, exactly. And in terms of the uh, financial value as priced in ferns, we're talking anywhere between 50 to $75 per haul, sometimes even $100 or more. So this is a real savings uh, that I'm and you know what? The the irritations I've had, some of which I've talked to you and will remain in private conversation regarding some of the uh, fun interactions with the Servile Society, my coworkers and, and bosses and such. Um, it's interesting, Shane. Uh, you know, this is almost equivalent to getting like a temporary raise of sorts. So the sting of having to deal with all of their nonsense is all greatly dulled because I've essentially been you know, getting the equivalent of like, you know, double or triple the pay now in a manner right. of speaking. But of course it's not a guarantee and it's not official. And like the, the, the boss's boss or whatever usually doesn't allow this kind of thing, but the acting managers do. There's very, it's very gray market. Like we're doing nothing illegal, so it doesn't count as black market, but it would just be probably against the health license that they have for something along those lines. Actually it's not. Well, it's funny. It's actually not where it's, what it is, is exploiting a loophole, which is why it's gray market. That's what I'm saying. This is totally gray market from start to finish. And I friggin' love it. 
Right. And uh, and it's funny. I mean, and, j- and just to kind of make the point, I was not actively looking for this. I was just doing my job and I kind of stumbled into it. And then once I found out it existed, then I pushed in the sense of uh, asking about it and so forth and found out that, yeah, this is a real thing, but just don't tell the boss's boss about it because he'll otherwise freak. And I'm like, OK, we're doing nothing wrong, even according to them laws and such. So at most, we would be kind of skirting the we wouldn't. And, and it's interesting, too, about like company policy. We're not even violating company policy as far as I'm aware of. Um, what's the old phrase? Uh, there's like violating the spirit of the law without breaking the letter of it. So in a sense, we're like violating the spirit of company policy without actually violating it, hence exploiting a loophole. Hmm. And I freaking love it. I mean, do you? I mean, p- not to go on too long about this, but people, do you understand how much food is wasted in this freaking country per day? And it's something I've written about before. And and the amount of stuff that I don't take home, it is downright wasteful. And I'm glad that at least a portion of that does go to people who are in in dire uh, straits, whether due to the Great Recession, so-called, or or just other reasons and whatever else. Uh, but yeah, man, I mean, whatever I'm taking home, as valuable as it is, way more is going elsewhere that that isn't even sold to the customers or anything else. I mean, people don't understand kind of like the back end from like within the company and such. And I, I don't think my employers are the only company in that in that particular industry that does this kind of thing because I have reason to believe that this is kind of like industry wide. That pretty much there's so much food wastage. And by the way, this is yuppie food specifically. This is nicer stuff. This is stuff that you would see in like a Whole Foods that's being thrown out or thankfully as the case is being donated to homeless people and such. That a portion of which I get to kind of grab out the way door as uh, part of the what has now been referred to by some of the older employees as the unofficial employee benefits package because we're yep. all part because we're all part time we don't get the so-called benefits so this is the the perk as as one of the veterans would call it and such so again not to go on too long about that I only say that to say this there is such a thing as ethical enclaves and and the listeners haven't listened to that episode they definitely should for more details I just figured I'd mention here that I've recently discovered a real one completely by accident. Right, right. That certainly certainly sounds interesting. Certainly sounds interesting. Um, but uh, I, I guess you know just a, a couple of preliminary notes here. Uh, one, you know, very very you know very important. Uh, but uh, this other one, you know, I just want to give a shout out to uh, to Jason Booth. Uh, he he uh, spent some time making uh, you know a bunch of memes for us to post on the uh, Vani page. He's he's been posting them too. But uh, you know we we certainly appreciate that. Uh, you know uh, uh, any meme that he makes, I don't have to. So uh, so yeah, certainly appreciate uh, all of his efforts. Uh, you know for putting those together and all. I'm a little behind, and you'll know why in a moment, but a little behind on uh, releasing those memes, but I'll, I'll certainly, uh, you know, get to that over the next uh, couple of weeks or so. Uh, keep a lookout for those. Uh, but Kyle, the most important thing, man, the most important thing, I am holding a physical copy of Vanu Life March 1973. I, I, I am right now, Kyle, I'm holding it in my hand. Sweet. It's pretty awesome, right? <laughs> kind of a little bit of a miracle how you came about that, right? Yeah, well, yeah, it was kind of funny. It was uh, actually Monday, you know, Monday of like, this past Monday. Uh, Derek Bros sent me a message and said, "Hey, have you seen this?" I said, "No." So I clicked on it. And it was like eight bucks, and it was shipping. And I was like, "Okay, yeah, snagging it." But this is, uh, you know, th- there were a couple on Amazon, uh, and uh, they were used, and they were going for like eighty nine dollars. And they were like the actual, like I, I don't know, like I don't know if these were reprinted or what was going on because it's on like you know very nice white. Um, it, it looks new. It doesn't look like it was from 1973. There's no wear on the paper or anything. So I don't know if, if uh, you know, someone reprinted some of these, you know, back in like the 90s or 2000s. I don't. I have no idea how it happened. But, uh, you know, the copies I've I saw on uh, Amazon, uh, you know, they were you know archived in like their you know their little uh, plastic sleeves and such, and you know they're kind of you know more brownish. So I don't know what happened with this one, but this is kind of like a brand new copy of that. So I don't. I've, I'm not quite sure uh, about 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 that one. Mm, man, that's, uh, that's trippy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was about to say. I think that's uh, a nice, succinct way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. So, so you guys really, you guys received. Um, I put out the spoken discourse that I did for uh, one of Rayo's new articles on Sunday. So you've gotten one of those. Um, but this is an eighty thousand plus word booklet, and I think I counted thirteen or fourteen new articles by Rayo, and I put like new in quotation marks because they're from nineteen seventy three. But uh, new to us at least, right? 
So yeah. eighty thousand plus words. And uh, you know, do you, do you, do you uh, have the uh, word count or the I guess the uh, the whatever it is the word the word count uh, on uh, on the actual book, Von of the Search Personal Freedom? It's about forty thousand. So basically, your your newest discovery is about what twice the length of the Vanu book. Then, that's what it's it's come it's what it's looking wow. like. Wow! Yeah. Wow! 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 So we 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 not only double our material, we did we did better than that. Our original source material. Okay, just as a side note, just to kind of dig it into the political crusaders one more time, no one should ever talk about establishment politicians like Donald Trump ever again because look at all this stuff that's being unearthed whether it's by you, Shane, or, or whatever else about practical forms of direct action that, that you and I can actually do, or at least has a chance of doing. I mean, if people care about the future of freedom, or in this case, Vanu, this is where it's at. I mean, this is the frontier. It was the frontier then, too. So, you know, yeah. it's, it, it will, it, you know, I really do think, you know, the state of servile society will always, will always exist. Yeah. You know, governments will always exist, unfortunately. Um, so this will always be, you know, for, forever into the future, I imagine. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I really do think, you know, Vani will be, uh, and, you know, Ray did, you know, mention, you know, it'll change over time. Mm -hmm. Uh, but Vani will certainly be, it's relevant for, it's hundred percent relevant for any sort of future that, uh, that, that you, you or I could foresee. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm just more making the point that, like, for example, when some so-called ANCAPs waste everybody's time with these debates on uh, the border debates or whatever, it's like, okay, why are they uh, – opportunity costs, ladies and gentlemen. Why spend the time and effort on these nonsensical border debates, which actually doesn't even address the real issues about protecting the private landowners on, on the so-called uh, – actually on the Rio Grande – uh, but then they'll spend all time and effort on a non-issue and instead ignore all this stuff that we've covered in previous episodes of TVP and, and also, Shane, what you've uncovered here, which are actual real issues like – what lifestyle changes can you make so that you have that you're more invulnerable to coercion than you were before? Right, right. So, so I, I guess I, I did this for the other podcasts I do, but I'll just kind of you know read I guess some of the the most intriguing titles of some of these articles. Um, and obviously, there are a few that uh, you know John Fisher did take from this issue. Uh, the two I can uh, the two I know off the top of my head: uh, a van for living a, a van for live aboard. Um, that's from the the that was uh, included in the original book, and also forty by eight feet of shelter for thirty dollars in one day. Um, but other than that, I think all of these other ones are new, uh, you know, going on the fly here. But obviously, uh, you know, there's a, an article which we'll read later on, a small boat for a uh, small boat for live aboard, not by Rayo, but by another interesting gentleman that I have no idea who he is, rightfully so. Uh, you know, there's a um, article, there's articles on money, you know, uh, how to avoid income tax, bring it home free, uh, secure banking, you know, all the stuff that you'd expect from uh, Loom Panic's uh, unlimited esque publications. Uh, communication, uh, you know, alternative ID. Uh, Kyle, you've written about uh, paper tripping uh, those books that were published on Lumpanics back uh, in the 80s or 90s. Um, yeah, I mean, this uh, this guy, I remember his name off the top of my head. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Uh, but yeah, he was, uh, you know, referencing uh, paper tripping. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. See, see the paper tripping books that I've written book reports on, um, two of them were by Barry Reed, and then a different book was by Trent Sands. However, those those books were all written in the 1990s. However, this Vanu Life issue was in 73, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the, the, the book that he references is The Paper Trip. And this is I'll, – I'll make this note here for uh, – and I'll, I'll make it in when I actually release the digitized version of this too. But there are some articles that we just don't know. We aren't clear on who the actual author is. Uh, like, for example, the article of Secure, ba Secure Banking was by Lysander. Uh, and then uh, the next articles, uh, alternate alternate ID and secure mailing address don't have authors. So we don't know if um, they just, you know, saved on ink uh, and, and printing uh, and just, uh, you know, only like if it's the same author, just, you know, run that through without putting the author on there. Uh, or if that just denotes to, OK, if there's no author, then it's one of the editors that wrote it, which would be Mike, or Mike Freeman or Rayo. Uh, so. Yeah, I guess that's just kind of a note. We don't know who wrote that article. I'm guessing, you know, I, I'm not even going to try to guess because I have no idea. Uh, but yeah, the person that wrote that article was talking about the paper trip. So I thought that was kind of relevant to stuff that you've looked into in the past. Yeah, I mean, though, though, I mean, that really is kind of the cutting edge of of security culture because even most privacy advocates who do talk about se uh, actual real security culture issues, most of them won't talk about paper tripping usually for two reasons. One, they're scared of it. 
or two, uh, they just simply don't know that it was even a thing, even back in the 90s, or as is the case here, back in the 70s. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, in, in many ways, Shane, much like how you and I are essentially breathing life into Vanu, it would be also rather interesting, uh, perhaps as a parallel or even in conjunction with Vanu, to maybe breathe some life into paper tripping. And actually, uh, this would be a topic for another time, but it's kind of an interesting question. Post 9 11, would paper tripping even work anymore? That so so for so so Kyle for those yeah we should have done this before but for those who who've never heard of the concept of paper tripping could you like just briefly you know define what that what that uh, activity is sure of course uh, loosely defined paper tripping is essentially the practice of acquiring a brand new legal ID uh, different name different social security number different driver's license et cetera et cetera uh, that is distinct from the one that you were born with. Uh, you completely create it from scratch, and the claim of the paper trippers is that you should be able to create this complete new legal ID uh, legally. Like, it's all based on legal interstices. All of it is. Uh, this is not, 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 not so-called identity theft. There's nothing black market about paper tripping at all. Paper tripping basically... You know what it actually is? It's very gray market, actually. It's all about exploiting loopholes and essentially proving that the bureaucracy is so bureaucratic that they don't even realize when people can create brand new legal IDs by just exploiting loopholes within their own system. Now, that was the claim right. back in the 70s and, and, and 90s. Um, what I don't know is if those loopholes or even newer ones uh, still exist post 9-11. And that, of course, would be a topic for another time. And just trying to really go into the nitty gritty and trying to answer that very pivotal question about whether paper tripping can be useful for anybody in, uh, <laughs> I guess you could say, as the Christians would put it, in the year of our Lord 2017. Uh, I just simply don't know. Most people won't even talk about it, not even the privacy advocates, most of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, governments, you know, have always, uh, you know, even, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, I mean, driver's licenses still existed and things. Um, so, you know, they, they've always, like, and Social Security, too, I mean, they, they, they like to tag their cattle. Uh, you know, uh, you know, IDs are for, for, for cattle, not for human beings. But uh, anyways, they like, they like that sort of stuff, and they've only gotten more rigorous about it, uh, you know, with their uh, identification for their tax cattle. So, uh, you know, I, I imagine, uh, you know, anything's possible, but uh, the question is, uh, you know, with all the work that would have to go into it, uh, is it worth it? And I guess that might have to be something. You know, maybe we, have, we probably should spend, uh, uh, you know, uh, an episode in season three talking about that and really diving into it. Because honestly, Kyle, I've read your book reports on that. But, uh, you know, beyond that and uh, kind of the, the, the brief, you know, mentions of it in, in various Limpanics and Limited books I've read, I don't know a whole lot about it. But, uh, you know, maybe <laughs> as with a lot of those books and, and like these publications, too, I mean, a lot of that stuff is going to be outdated and have to be updated in season three. So, yes. And, and those book reports were more about like the paper trippers in the 90s for the most part. And so it was looking kind of like a snapshot in, I guess, what you could say activist history uh, in a manner of speaking which I think is valuable for other reasons. But then there's the other question of, as a form of direct action, are the legal interstices still exploitable even post 9-11? And that I just honestly just don't know. Um, so that that's kind of something interesting, right? And I agree with you. It should be uh, possibly an episode for season three. Right, right. So, so I guess just a couple other ones. Uh, Troglodyte Community, which uh, was by Rayo. Then another one, uh, Smoomans, the Super Hobos. That's S M U M A N S. Uh, so we we've got another new word from from our boy Rayo here, and I have to get back to it. I, I it's 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 a strange concept. So let me actually get to the page here. Uh, okay, Smoomans. Uh, Smoom stands for seclusion and mobility using multiplicity. So seclusion and mobility using multiplicity. Uh, so, uh, I guess that would come down to, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, staying in a secluded spot, being mobile and doing that over and over again, I guess would be the, I guess another vernacular way to break that down. Uh, so yes, yeah, Smoomins, the super hobos, uh, very interesting piece. I'm excited to, obviously, I'm excited to get this entire thing out to you guys. Uh, this is going to be uh, quite a project, but, uh, you know, I, I plan on doing this, you know, I've got a handful of feelers out there for, for other publications. So, uh, we might be, we might be doing this a lot, I man. It might need some, uh, full-time volunteers on hand. Uh, you know, I hope it comes to that, don't you, Kyle? <laughs> yeah, it's it's quite possible. So yeah, for for those folks who have been kind of with us, especially since the start of TVP or shortly thereafter, uh, folks who would like to contribute in some way and perhaps not uh, financially, if that is not where their strength lies, then this would be another way to well contribute is your labor, 
your time in helping to essentially uh, breathe life into this uh, uh, recently released or this attempt to release this material from 73 and make it available on the internet and digitize it and helping us here at TVP actually digitize this material that is outside the bounds of just the original Vanu book where that John Fisher was the editor of. So uh, it, as so listeners, if you're not in a position to uh, throw uh, dollars or Bitcoin at us, then another thing you could help us with is just donate your time and effort, labor, in helping us digitize this uh, original material, not in the original Vanu book, but in uh, this issue of Vanu Life. Uh, that can actually help us develop Vanu uh, better than we already have. Yeah, yeah, and and it really is. I mean, this is what I've done. You know, ever since I since I've you know began my work in the alternative media. You know, one thing I've always done is I there are massive archives available at uh, libertyunderattack.com. You know, I, I I like to you know make everything available in one place, easily downloadable, and uh, you know that's kind of the same thing here with uh, with all this Vanu material. And, uh, you know, uh, even though, you know, it might seem, you know, just a little tedious, you know, like uh, uh, a little tedious and maybe, you know, just kind of, uh, well, I'll, sp I'll spend an evening, you know, doing some transcribing or whatever. Uh, you know, it may seem small, but di but digitizing these things for posterity, because uh, you know how hard Kyle and I have, have had to, you know, look for these things. So our goal is to obviously, you know, make these things available in just so many locations that for anyone looking for it in the future... They don't have to go through the same shit that Kyle and I had to to figure to find all of this, right? Uh, so you know, it's certainly more efficacious than uh, political crusading uh, or your collective movementism or anything like that. Uh, it definitely is, and uh, you would not only be doing a service to us and for for the listeners, you'd also be doing a service to you know uh, future generations, uh, you know, who, who discover Vanu, uh, and uh, they won't have just the book to work with. They'll have all of the material that we've we've made available. So I uh, would certainly appreciate any help. Uh, on that one, but uh, Kyle, you know, this is this one kind of uh, you know threw me. This next thing here, so uh, apparently we've been pronouncing Vanu wrong the entire time. What? <laughs> yep. Uh, yep. All right. Well, where where does this come from? Okay, so this is uh, so to start out, I'm guessing this is what uh, you know Rayo did for each uh, installment, but obviously he has the uh, note to mail order buyers about the small print. So yeah, I guess this is another note. So this is only like a 34 page booklet. Outcome that comes out to 80,000 words. So it's four pages onto, you know, one singular page and the font is extremely small. So, um, so, so yeah, there, there's that. But yeah, if, if you're interested in, uh, I meant to mention this, if you're interested in, uh, transcribing, just uh, shoot me an email, Shane at BonniePodcast.com or, you know, message the Facebook page, uh, or message me personally. Uh, and, uh, I can get you some scans, uh, to, to help out with that. But, uh, the, the note following about the small print is what is Vonnie an introduction? And this is the first paragraph, and I'm cursing John Fisher from the he, he might be dead, he might not be. Cursing John Fisher, you know, he left this part out. Pretty crucial. But uh, anyways, uh, so quote, Vanu means relative physical vulnerability to coercion. Vanu rhymes with Sonu. So it's Vonu is how it's supposed to be pronounced. <laughs> Vonu. <laughs> Damn it. Um, yeah, so I talked, I talked to you about this in pre-show, and I don't know if I want to change, man. You've been, so I've been saying this for, I mean, actually, it's been a year now. Uh, it's been almost a year, so actually over a year, because the direct action series ended, uh, you know, about a year ago. Um, so yeah, we've been saying, you know, Vonnie wrong for a year. I don't want to change that. You know, I don't think it's really that big of a deal. What do you think? I don't think it's that big of a deal. I mean, if some people want to pronounce it the other way, I, I guess that's fine. I mean, the the point though was that in terms of Vanu. <sighs> Rayo's idea was to coin a word, just to remind people pretty much, I think this was ep in episode one, actually, all the way back there, that the idea was to essentially coin a new term that was kind of like sovereignty, but not the same thing but, uh, in terms of the political connotations and uh, uh, like right to rule. The idea was invulnerability to coercion, hence the new word Vanu. Right, right. And I guess I, it might have been word. Yeah, I guess he, he says this, you know, in the next sentence, quote, Vanu is somewhat like freedom or security, but those words mean many different things to different people. Rather than argue about what those words ought to mean, I speak of Vonu or Vanu. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, end quote. So that's, yeah, I mean, exactly, you know, just, just how you kind of explained it. So, uh, and I guess one other development, and this is this is blowing my mind, man. I mean, so Rayo's Freemate, free uh, if you guys recall back to the the article where I kind of, you know, wrote it, compared and contrasted, you know, Sam Conkin and what Sam Conkin had to say about Rayo. Well, uh, you know, uh, Conkin had something else to call, uh, you know, uh, uh, Rayo's Freemate. Uh, so, so the so so in this publication, uh, his Freemate's name was Halen Hygia. That's H A E L A N. So Halen Hygia. 
Uh, and that's that's what it was in this publication. So 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 Kyle, we have Roberta, which was from you know the Vonnie book. Then we have Naomi, which was from you know Sam, Sam Conkin. And now we have Halen. So I guess the question that comes to mind for me is, did she just you know decide to change names a lot, or you know did Rayo just you know have you know just women you know just waiting to like just begging to come out to his polyethylene eight? And I mean I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> come on out here, baby. I'll, I'll show you my tent out in the woods. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, man. I mean maybe maybe in some sense both are true. Um, you know, it, it's kind of been kind of a running joke in certain uh, libertarian circles of one kind or another over the years that there are uh, more polyamorous than not. So maybe such was the case during the so-called countercultural period of the 60s and the early 70s when Rayo was around, right? Um, I, I guess that's possible, I suppose. Um, although you, you mentioned you kind of referenced Konkin a moment ago. Yeah, I, I think Konkin had a kid and there was like only one woman on the record, on the public record we know of that he actually, you know, uh, had a, a intimacy with in, in, in the biblical sense. So I, I guess maybe uh, as far as we know of, Rail was uh, – <laughs> he uh, got around a little bit or more maybe, sowing or maybe seeds. It was, maybe it was him and like three other women out there in that tent. I mean, no, no, it's just, it, it wasn't that big, guys. It wasn't that big. <laughs> so – if I had to guess, if I had to speculate, it was probably the same woman. Probably the same woman. Like how many so, – so let me ask you this. So, 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 so nowadays, how many women could you find, Kyle, that would be willing to you know, move out in the woods into a polyethylene A tent? Well, speaking only about women here in the Austin area, that would probably be a big fat zero. Yeah. So consider you know, 40, 50 years ago when, you know, again, you know, as, as I've said before, you know, when people you know, even further didn't recognize the scourge of government – uh, you know, trying to convince, you know, uh, one woman, let alone three different ones, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, the, the Vani life, uh, wilderness Vani is what we need to do, what we need to do. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's uh, I think it's probably the same woman. <laughs> yeah, more more likely than not. I mean, obviously, we're kind of speculating a bit here, but I'm glad you did notice that kind of discrepancy regarding the names, Shane. I, I do think that's it's it's a rather peculiar uh, set of details, right? But what it actually means is it one woman with multiple names, pseudonyms, or is it uh, really just three different women? I I guess we will never know quite exactly. Um, and of course, there's the third possibility, which is actually it's both different women, all with multiple pseudonyms, and so maybe it actually is more than three women. You never know. Yeah, or maybe, you know, he liked mobility a lot, so maybe, you know, further invulnerability to coercion was changing women off. I, I don't know. I don't, you know, I, <laughs> having I'm not a, sure. Having a girl in a different port, almost that bad, right? Yeah, each of his, he has, uh, yeah, he leaves one woman at, at each of his uh, normal camp spots and he rotates around every couple of few weeks. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, well, we don't know for certain. All we know for certain is that you notice these details where his free mate's name keeps changing depending on the source material, right? So one's Roberta, another one's Naomi, and now there's Halion, right? And that's the only thing we know for certain. Anything beyond that is speculation and conjecture at this point. Right, right. So, so with all this new material, Kyle, I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, it, 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 you know, much of it will get worked into, you know, what episodes as we get to, you know, through season two. Um, but uh, but you know, for you know, for 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 some of these things, you know, I think we might put, put out some Patreon episodes, uh, you know, just discussing the new articles. Uh, you know, by, I don't know, choose a section each and release a Patreon episode on that. Uh, you know, it's kind of a bonus. Uh, so yeah, you guys can support us through Patreon as well. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I I imagine, I mean, that that'd be a pretty good way to do it. I mean, because I don't want to, I don't want to, you know halt the flow of season two right i, I don't want to do that it'd have to be an intermission or uh, i just don't want to do side episodes man i just don't want to so i think you know the, first off you know releasing them on patreon and then maybe if we have a, like an intermission between season two and season three which i imagine we will just release uh you know those episodes then which at this point it might be it'll probably be you know july of, or january of 2018 and by the by this point so uh anyways so what do you think about that recording some patreon episodes you know discussing uh you know i guess these these new these new articles i think i think that's a good idea for a lot of reasons it kind of gives those uh, particular uh types of uh, listeners kind of a little a little bonus extra and i think it's also good for one other reason too um you know ladies and gentlemen think about this we're still trying to kind of go through the original Vanu book, albeit Section 2, hence Season 2. Uh, but yet we're finding, and Shane in particular, is actually finding more material than we can actually release podcasts for uh, in, in, in a sense. So that's actually very uh, a very good sign. 
that we're going to be basically swimming in original material for quite some time to come. And that doesn't even count the season three material, which is mainly uh, you and I actually uh, really expanding on Vanu beyond uh, it, obviously in the spirit of rail, but kind of taking different things and combining it, especially for this uh, with the uh, new technologies and even methods that are available during this early 21st century as well. So uh, I guess, folks, kind of what I'm kind of getting at here is, is that we are swimming. And maybe that makes it a little bit of a nice segue to uh, our topic for this particular episode. But we are swimming in original material material that the original the original material is coming in faster than we can make podcast for. And which is actually a good sign. So we're not running out anytime soon, folks. And believe you me, I don't want to say too much and give away too much here, but I'll just say this. I have looked at some at some of the material in depth, especially for season three. And yeah, we are not running out, maybe even I'm not bragging. We may never run out of material because there's so many no. where there's so many technological ver uh, innovations. There's also unique ideas. Uh, one, I actually, Shane, I'll I'll tell you this, um, you know, uh, uh, privately. But there's actually been two people that have asked actually suggested things to me in private conversation that might be a good episode idea for season three, uh, regarding uh, certain arrangements that can be made and all that. So it's, it's there's there's just so much. There's so much, and it's a good thing. But yeah, when I listen to some other forms of libertarian media and they're just doing the whole news cycle, uh, sometimes uh, collective movementism more often than not, you know, I just kind of go oh, hang my head. I'm like, wow, you guys are just out of material, aren't you? That's all I can think of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's <laughs> I, I've mentioned kind of offhand, you know, uh, in some of these in some previous episodes that, you know, even just, you know, the subject we'll discuss today. In season three, that'll probably be like five or six episodes. Oh, easily. Like, there's so much to get into. Easily. Uh, and and especially, you know, developing upon upon what Rayo had to say. Yeah, there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of uh, you know nuanced minutia that is necessary. You know, uh, that we'll have to go into. So, uh, so yeah, fantastic. Like super excited about Vanu Life March 1973. Uh, you know, had the book. Now we have this other physical publication, which will you know, <laughs> twice as many articles. So. Uh, you know, that's uh, that's that's pretty fantastic. So uh, let's go ahead and move forward here. We've got 33 minutes, 34 minutes into the podcast, Kyle, and we're now just getting into. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. So this episode is titled Minimalist Sailboating, Setting Sail for Sunnier Waters, and the show notes can be found at bonniepodcast.com forward slash 23. Now, I think before we get into the definitions, it would be wise to direct you to the very first episode of this season two on financial independence. Not living on land, it's going to be more difficult to find employment, uh, which leaves a few possibilities for individuals interested in pursuing minimalist sailboating. Uh, now, when I, you know, lay out these three possibilities, no, I mean they, these they're obst they're going to be obstacles that you have to overcome, uh, you know, despite any you know choice that you make in pursuance of Vanu. Uh, so these are, you know, you, these can be overcome and they have been overcome, uh, but these are kind of the three possibilities that I see. And I'll let you respond, Kyle. After uh, maybe I'm missing one or something like that, but uh, uh, the three possibilities: one, you can already be financially independent and not have to worry about money. Uh, that's the exception, not the rule. You know, most individuals worry about money. You know, it's kind of one of the biggest stressors. Uh, number two, you could say uh, work at a dock in a country for three to four months a year and sell the rest of the year. Or number three, you could have an internationally mobile business, not rely upon a fixed location. Uh, so those are kind of the three ways that I see, you know, uh, you know, kind of the financial aspect coming about on a boat. So what do you think, Kyle? Considering the multiple paths to financial independence, some of which we mentioned in that episode and other ones which which are probably better for uh, uh, for season three. Um, I agree with you uh, on those on those different uh, variations and such. Um, and pretty much, I mean, so far, that kind of seems to be the case, right? So, like, even the third, uh, the internationally mobile business, well, that would, mm, a lot of that would probably be some form of telecommuting and relying on internet or, or, or some sort of communications medium and such. And uh, the second way would be uh, temp work, you know, working in a country for three or four months and then, and then kind of shooting out. And, and that at war, you know, you've already done your intensive saving or some other form of it. And thus, uh, you don't need to worry about pleasing a boss or anything else like that. So I, I think your three different ways are, are pretty much where it's at. All right. So uh, I guess uh, we'll 
Uh, I guess we'll, we'll, this will be a little different than most of the episodes. We'll do the definitions, then the current legal requirements, kind of a brief overview, and also kind of addition of a couple of things, uh, you know, just to get us on the same page here uh, before we really get into it. But, uh, Kyle, let's get into some definitions here. Uh, what is uh, liveaboard? What does that mean? Liveaboard is a term used among sailboating individuals and families who live full time in their sea vessel. Uh, so uh, what is uh, minimalism? And, and I guess, yeah, what is minimalism? And then we'll, we'll kind of talk about that afterwards. Ah, uh, yes, minimalism. Okay, so minimalism is defined as the ideology and practice of simplifying one's accumulated property through decluttering, which allows the individual to focus on what's truly important to himself. And uh, I guess I'll mention this, you know, why, why are we talking about minimalism here? Well, if you're going to be living on a boat, you're not going to be able to take all the stuff that you have in your three-bedroom house, right? <laughs> it's pretty simple. I mean, you're going to have to get rid of a lot of stuff. You're, you're pretty much going to have to bear necessities, unless you, like, for, for most individuals. I mean, it might be, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a decent sailboat or something, but those are still pretty small. Unless you have, like, a luxury yacht. Um, then, uh, then yeah, you, you're probably going to have to, or I guess, regardless, uh, you're, you're, you're going to have to, you know, cut back on some things and kind of go more to the necessities, right? Yeah. And, and obviously people who are more familiar with like dumpster diving or things more along those lines are already kind of, uh, oriented towards, at least in some sense, having, uh, in some ways having less, uh, private property in terms of like new, how many possessions they have and so forth. And I think they're the ones who, uh, are probably can make an easier switch from going from the typical survival society type way of living in an apartment and or house or, or, or uh, whatever to living on a boat full time. And yeah, the, the space restrictions on a sailboat, yes, they're profound, but then again, here's an interesting question for people to keep in mind. How much different would it be living on a sailboat full time versus living in a so-called tiny home? Ah, uh, see, there's space restrictions there too. Right, right, and and I mean, I guess even with this, even with the space, res uh, the space restrictions, uh, I mean, uh, you're out in the ocean, like because uh, the the wide open ocean. You know, I I I think it'd be really hard for somebody to get claustrophobic. Uh, you know, unless there was no possible way they could leave. You know, like I guess maybe like the cabin area, like maybe they could get claustrophobic. But if you're, I I mean. When you consider all of the, uh, you know, the vast uh, real estate available out there on the open ocean, you know, I don't think, uh, you know, the space really, uh, uh, really, you know, uh, would, would be that big of a deal uh, in all honesty. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely something to consider, I suppose. But yes, in terms of what we mean by in terms of our definitions here of like minimalist sailboating, which is what this episode's about, we're really kind of talking about. Not something like a private city on the water or whatever, like we've mentioned in earlier episodes of this very season, but rather you and a, you by yourself or you and a free mate or you and your nuclear family even, because maybe you can have maybe small children aboard, depending on how much room there is or how much you know room you're willing to give up. Uh, basically living on your own sailboat and doing that full time, which of course necessitates not having that much stuff as well as the fact that whatever stuff you do have, like everything, it's more like being a backpacker in a sense. Where like that, yeah, that's exactly that's exactly like so. so if if your if your only mode of transportation is a boat, uh, and you're getting supplies, I mean, you, you'll have to. I mean, you got to consider what you can carry back to. Um, so you're not gonna be able to carry back, you know, flat screen televisions or anything of that nature. Uh, well, maybe you'll be able to. I don't know, but uh, but there there's. You have to be able to haul anything you bring onto your boat, so obviously it's going to be, you know, the necessities, right? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And that does seem to kind of jive with, uh, for example, some of those couples who are right now uh, living on their sailboats full time. And I think there was one couple in question who I think was was doing things like uh, they would, uh, you know, they would dock, uh, you know, at a dock somewhere and uh, lay anchor or whatever the term is. And then they would take their bicycles right into town, get their supplies, and then go back to uh, their home. So in terms of like import-export, uh, their uh, their import-export wa wa was kind of that way, you know, combination, you know, boat plus uh, bicycle uh, being one way they can kind of do that import-export import in a manner of speaking. Right, right. So... Let's get on to kind of the the current uh, you know kind of the current legal you know system uh, I guess kind of, kind of the laws that that are in place now when it that would apply to uh, to sailboating. So I've I mentioned some of these before, but so generally speaking, in regards to the United States, 
up to 24 nautical miles or 27 miles off the territorial sea baseline is known as the contiguous zone, uh, wherein states can still exert limited control, uh, you know, for example, infringements of customs, you know, fiscal, immigration, or sanitary laws. Um, so just a note when I was, you know, researching for this, there are other contiguous zone claims, um, but the majority fall under the 24 nautical miles or no contiguous zone claim whatsoever. Uh, it was actually, you know, surprising. You know, there are probably just as many, you know, without contiguous as there were as there were with the 24 nautical miles. Uh, so and I noticed, you know, a lot of the kind of the tropical, you know, kind of like the like the Bahamas. Uh, there's no contiguous zone for for the Bahamas, and obviously there's still the exclusive economic zone, which we'll talk about in a moment. But but uh, you know, for for those zones that a contiguous zone, uh, I mean, you could, I mean, be, I mean, hypothetically, you should be able to float there without any issue whatsoever, regardless of how close you are to the coast, which would cut cut your costs on internet if you can still reach terrestrial, uh, you know, antennas. Uh, anyways, we'll get more into that momentarily. Uh, now, up to 200 miles out from the territorial sea baseline is the exclusive economic zone. Uh, wherein the coastal nation has control of all economic resources within. So this would be anything from, uh, you know, deep sea drilling to you know, minerals on the ocean floor to, uh, you know, any, you know, any land, like any islands or, uh, you know, lagoons or anything like that. Uh, anywhere there's land involved uh, or resources, uh, that country would have, you know, the, they would have jurisdiction over all of that. Uh, so if you're going to use any of that, you have to, you have to ask for their permission or, you know, uh, uh, or you better not get caught, I guess is just one way, one way to put it. Uh, now the next one uh, is, it's, I think it's called flagging. Uh, now, I'm sorry if my verbiage is off here, but uh, you'll, you'll get what I'm saying. So your boat must be flagged out of some nation's port. Uh, you know, whether it's, uh, it do doesn't matter what country. It do doesn't matter. It has to be, a, you know, just some recognized country or nation. Uh, and if you don't, if, you, if you're out there on your boat without a flag, without a, without a flag of some country, uh, you could be labeled as a pirate. And, uh, you know, you know what sorts of things happen to pirates, right? Uh, so, yeah, you, you might as well just, and you can find cheap countries to, 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 fla to, to flag your, to I wish I knew all the verbiage to flag your boat. Uh, you you could uh, you, you can do it very cheaply in in, in some countries. So um, that's important. Make sure you have a, a flag on your boat. Uh, and then uh, just one other note that that Kyle actually came uh, found uh, during pre-show was that uh, the U.S. Coast Guard only has jurisdiction to the boundary of the exclusive economic zone. So the only re the only way you're going to have to deal with the United States, you know, and their their bludgies at all, uh, is if you're within that 200 miles zone. And if you aren't, then they have no jurisdiction whatsoever. So uh, I guess on that note, to turn it over to you, Kyle, what, you, got, you got anything there? So I suppose if you're at 201 miles, or just to be on the safe side because, you know, they, they don't obey their own laws and such, let's say 205 miles. Let's let's give it a little bit of a buffer. I, I guess the Coast Guard can't touch you at 205 miles then, I suppose? You know, you know by, by the, you know, by, by what I, by what I, by what by what you're able to find, you know, I, I would say that's accurate. But then again, you know, these people don't follow their own laws. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I just and I mentioned this to you uh, to you as well. But uh, that's a law. Like, that's a long way. I don't think they just you know patrol that area of water. Uh, <laughs> so if you're even you know I would say you're even like a hundred miles out. Uh, and I don't know this from you know personal experience, but that's that's a long you know to and fro time. Uh, you know, to and from the port. So, uh, you know, I don't think they're just, uh, you know, trolling around that 200 mile marker. Uh, I, I don't think they are. Uh, but, but anyways, anyways, it's just kind of just, I guess, one, I guess, important note before moving forward. Yeah. And, and obviously I think it's kind of important to just kind of for everybody to keep in mind that the legal jurisdiction may or may not be exactly uh, consistent uh, between different countries, which is why we're focusing on the United States and, and I guess some areas of North America and such. But again, maybe perhaps going through all those 20 million different details might be better for, for a future episode, maybe even a Patreon episode, maybe, uh, in order to kind of go through whatever the legalities are. Even things like whether, you know, <laughs> whether, kind of like with driving, do you need a driver's license? It's like, well, what's the equivalent of boating? Do you need a boating license? And again, maybe that would be appropriate right, yeah. for, a few, for, for a different episode on that. But in terms of just a brief overview, uh, yeah, I, I just find it kind of interesting that uh, the flagging is an attempt by these nation state governments to uh, <laughs> say, well, you must you must be on the citizenship leash 
you know, you can't ever actually be a free human. Well, I, I don't I don't think you have to be a citizen of that country. You just need um, a... that you're that you're being. You have to have a flag from there. Oh, okay. Um, and 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 there are other and, and I, I'm the communication specialist for the Marinia Project, and I've talked to uh, when I interviewed Bob uh, on the subject, he did kind of explain that, uh, you know, uh, and, and obviously like you choose a country um, where it was cheap and where they don't have you know very many laws. Um, cause then you, the, the reason they do that is they want you to be bound by some sort of, uh, you know, country's laws when you're out there on the open ocean. Uh, so you, you the, the best, you know, the ideal thing is to find a country where, uh, there's like no laws whatsoever, just kind of, well, we just stick with the United Nations, you know, uh, treaty or whatever, whatever it's called. And, uh, you know, that's it. Pay us 20 bucks and yeah, go have fun. Uh, so there, there we'll, we'll certainly have to get more in detail on that. I guess one other note, as far as, you know, porting out, cause I've, I've watched, this is this is my favorite subject to look into, as you guys are well aware, as Kyle is well aware. But uh, uh, you know, I've watched a lot of videos on YouTube of people like you know they kind of you know do vlogs of their like sailing across like the Atlantic or Pacific or, or whatever they're doing, and uh, you know there have been a few where they've they pulled it like they pulled into a port, uh, and you know they have to stop the boat, like out you know not I, I don't know how far they just have to stop before they get to the port, then the the uh, captain has to get on the dinghy, the small boat, and then drive up there. Everyone else has to remain on the boat, and then they do all their searches and stuff. Um, now that, I don't remember what ports those were specifically, but obviously, ideally, you'd find one where they don't give a shit. <laughs> like, that'd probably be the best. I don't know how many of those exist now. Maybe they really don't. I, 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 I'm not sure, but I'm sure you can find some, um, you know, small countries in, in, in South America or something like that where they just say, yeah, we don't care. Uh, but, uh, but, yeah, that's something to kind of, you know, keep, keep in mind. Because uh, when when Rayo and others were proposing these these ideas, uh, yeah, the laws weren't as stringent. Uh, but so I, I guess that's just kind of something to note there too. Yes, and and right as we're about to kind of dive into what Rayo said, Shane, I know even ever since season one, I know that you've been looking forward to this episode like all heck, and it is finally here. We get to talk about in detail about living on a sailboat full time. So are you excited? Yeah, I, I am excited. And we'll actually end the Vani podcast after this because it's all we need to talk. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, yeah, let's get into what Rayo had to say and uh, we will discuss. So this first one is from uh, Innovator March 1967. Quote, be mobile in occupation. Avoid professions which require long-term fixed resident or extreme specialization. Consider instead jobs involving travel, the ocean, and or boats. The fisherman or charter boat operator is already afloat and knowledgeable of the sea. Independent intellectual activities. Many writers, artists, inventors, and researchers do their work almost anywhere. Temporary skilled employments. The job shopping engineer, designer, or technician not only commands a higher wage rate than his permanently employed counterpart, but he can be gone for months or years between jobs. Migrant labor. Harvest workers can not only earn relatively high wages on a piecework basis, but can usually arrange to take their pay in produce, which they can, uh, which they can then resell, avoiding taxes. Services to other sea mobiles. As floating communities grow, medical, educational, and repair skills will be in demand, end quote. So the first thing, and, and it's something I kind of recognized whenever, um, when uh, I re initially read the book, but, uh, you know, Rayo talked about the Bahamas a lot. And uh, he talked about, you know, being mobile in occupation, such as an engineer. Uh, so, you know, I, I think, you know, even before, you know, Rayo really um, began his, uh, his actual, like before he kind of, you know, coined the term and such, uh, you know, I think he was already practicing Vanu, like he was, uh, you know, kind of a freelance engineer working on various projects. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. Those, those all seem like uh, some, some reasonable and very much in line with, uh, you know, we, I kind of raised the concern of, you know, the how are you going to make your money? Well, here's some solutions that Ray offers. Yes. And just to kind of reiterate the point from just a little bit ago, for those of you who haven't had a chance yet to listen to the premiere opening episode for season two on financial independence, please do so. Because literally what Rayo was kind of saying here was taking some of those ideas relating to financial independence and directly applying it to if you were to do the minimalist sailboating thing, how would you earn a livelihood? And so some of his suggestions, as you can kind of tell, involve either making your livelihood directly from said sailboating in some way, or you're either doing kind of like a seasonal temp type of work where uh, you might weigh anchor, you know, in one in one port and then work for a bit and then kind of cut loose for a while uh, kind of thing. So that's just something to kind of keep in mind. Um, the whole notion of the Servile Society's you know, nine to five, Monday through Friday is not, 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 not the idea here. 
Certainly not. Certainly not. Uh, he continues, quote, one excellent way to combine the advantages of permanent residence with mobility is by making home aboard a boat. With the development of molded fiberglass holes and synthetic fiber rigging and sails, yachts are becoming less expensive and easier to maintain. Already comparing not too unfavorably with land-based dwellings of the same size, end quote. So, I mean, yeah, technology was getting cheaper whenever uh, whenever he wrote this article in 1967. And, uh, you know, I've, I've looked around. I've looked around. Uh, you know, obviously, all these are out of my price range, uh, you know, unless I were to, uh, you know, fix up about myself. And I don't have that, that expertise yet. But, uh, but yeah, obviously, you know, price has gone up some. But, uh, you know, compared to, you know, a physical house or, you know, paying a year year's rent in, apartment, uh, in an apartment, you know, not too bad. Not too bad, honestly. So... No, no, not not too bad. Although, again, it, you know, when he mentions about the advantages of a permanent residence by making a home aboard a boat, again, you know, that would be an interesting question regarding a legal interstice, like in terms of uh, if you were to have like a passport, could you use your boat as as a permanent fixed residence or whatever? Probably not, but that would be an interesting question to tackle at a later time. But yes, uh, but otherwise, in terms of that, that's more uh, legal interstices. Regarding reality, though, uh, yeah, Rayo is basically essentially saying just live on the boat full time. And he's saying the technology is there to actually make it a reality. And the technology is even more so there now. Uh, you know, to, to make this, uh, you know, to, to make it a very, you know, kind of amenable, uh, comfortable uh, living situation, you know, minus kind of the space concern that we, that we mentioned earlier. But uh, let's continue. Quote, as more libertarians take to the water, some will doubtless anchor and migrate more or less together as a semi-permanent waterborne community, saving time and money through the exchange of services. Internal free trade, not subject to the scrutiny of any state, end quote. So I will mention here, Kyle, as I mentioned, when we, when we talked about the sovereign free port episodes, I, I kind of said that I, I, I see I see these kind of coming about a different way, which is why I'm ordering it higher than, you know, some other things. Uh, I, I think these could come about, uh, you know, more more spontaneously, such as, you know, these semi like these uh, semi permanent communities. Uh, you know, I, I do think those could turn into something like a sovereign free port, uh, you know, just again, spontaneously, like with with, with such an association. So uh, I, I don't know, like I, I, I feel like. Um, if, you know, people just, uh, you know, if, if, you know, let's say an, a crew of anarchists, you know, goes and, and scouts out the Bahamas, you know, 200 miles off in the middle, of, like in the, however many miles off, you know, in the middle of the sea. And, uh, you know, people just start moving there and, you know, continues happening and more, more migration there. Then, uh, you know, I could see, you know, a saw like a, something like a sovereign free port come into fruition where, uh, you know, maybe it wouldn't be as, uh, you know, as it wouldn't need all that capital investment. It would just be spontaneous. It'd be, it, it would actually be, you know, uh, um, grassroots, right? It wouldn't be from, uh, you know, uh, um, a CEO trying to start a free port resort or uh, it wouldn't be whatever. You know what I mean, right? Yeah, you are making an assumption, though. You're making an assumption that an intentional community – please see previous episode on intentional communities – you're making an assumption that an intentional community on the water in the way that Rayo describes here could someday perhaps hypothetically at some future point indescribably magically become a sovereign free port in, in some sense and maybe in a more de facto way without all the uh, – Yeah, the without, without all this – without the political crusading and such. Yeah, that's right. like where, it's, where it's a major trading zone um, you know, of just boats. Um, like it's not actually like a big barge. It's not, you know, a fixed location or anything like that. It's just, you know, be like, you know, I don't know, you know, maybe, you know, uh, um, it's just, it, it's a, there's just a lot of trade happening there and, you know, it morphs into like, you know, maybe like a sovereign free port esque sort of thing, not actually kind of, right. like, yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, ta yeah, the, um, the intentional community or the voluntary floating association, which I think is pretty much the next quote to kind of flesh this out. Is is pretty much a TAS. It's a temporary autonomous zone, whereas the sovereign free port is more of a PAS or a permanent autonomous zone where it's more stationary. And I think the more deeper issues, I don't see how it's even possible for a TAS of any kind to morph over time into a PAS of any kind. Uh, but again, perhaps the next quote by Rail will kind of illuminate uh, what exactly this voluntary floating association would look like. Right, right. And we've read this quote in other places, but obviously it's relevant here, so we'll read it again. Quote, the Voluntary Floating Association has some advantages over the free hamlet in the hills. Not only will anchors be lowered where state interference is minimal, the very mobility discourages intervention. For instance, state school officials seldom molest the children of transients. 
Another blessing for parents, the irrational coerciveness influence of outside peer groups and mass communication media is considerably reduced. Differences of objective and conflicts of personality, which may disrupt an immobile intentional community, are easily resolved. The dissenters weigh anchor, and a community can develop by easy steps and without formal direction. No would-be founder need acquire a large tract of land, uncertain as to market demand or the response of the state. The floating voluntary society begins with a population of one. End quote. So, yeah, he kind of alluded to the fact that, you know, no would-be founder need acquire a large tract of land. Uh, or, you know, a, uh, you know, a large, uh, whatever, yeah. Uh, so, he kind of, yeah, he kind of, you know, uh, exactly what I said just a moment ago. Uh, but yeah, floating voluntary society begins with a population of one. You know, I like that kind of spontaneous uh, uh, design, if that makes sense. Yeah, l l let me kind of put make an addendum to what I said a moment before, since you since you read that quote. I think it is very possible and even desirable if you have an intentional community such as a type of that, like being the voluntary floating association you just mentioned and Rayo mentioned, uh, developing into an ethical enclave that i think is very practical because right. it's it's it, because it would still be a taz because the mobility is you know <laughs> the mobility would actually increase uh, its mean time to harassment and so forth in fact actually uh, at least i think so so even if the bludgies were able to get a whiff and a, a sniff uh, say from a snitch or from their uh, technology like uh, the the global satellites or whatever, and they found that oh, a bunch of uh, people who uh, don't live in the servile site for the most part or only some of the time are congregating in like this particular cove, and then let's say they send the coast guard or the, even the navy to go investigate. Uh, or whatever, and then they show up and find out there's nobody there, and they haven't been there for several months, of course, because it's not a PAS, it's a TAS. They only right. sometimes, you, you, you see, there, there's all of that again one more time. And so I, I think that's kind of important to consider. So in terms of like the intentional community of the Voluntary Flo Floating Association morphing into something else as time goes on, I think it would be an ethical enclave, personally. Because that's, that's that, still the, a task. The, the, the question is, though, uh, ethical enclaves, you know, will we'll just, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's agorism. If there's uh, no, the, the, there's no law against, um, you know, especially if you're beyond that, uh, that exclusive economic zone. I mean, what the government's already gone. I mean, there's no, there's no rulers out there. Uh, so what? It, I don't think it could be considered an ethical enclave at that point. If it was inside the exclusive economic zone, and they found out that, uh, like. Uh, you were like there was an you were using island to grow some illicit substances and you were you know <laughs> shipping it back to you know the United States coast with uh, yeah. uh, with boats that might draw some attention and right. uh, you know might get you in trouble but uh, I, I really think you know <laughs> I, I think generally I, I don't think there would even be you know uh, any any government at all I, I don't think it really be an ethical enclave uh, uh, really I, I I don't think it would be just just by definition fair enough fair enough and i guess and i guess to kind of further refine this and get it precise it would only be an ethical enclave if it was within uh it was mentioned earlier what was it 20 miles or really really close to the shore right the um, contiguous, contiguous zone for sure exclusive economic yes. zone maybe maybe right um, but 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 again you know, keep in mind uh you know, the listeners as well um that you know, ethical enclaves are, you know, uh, it's transactions conducted independent of that government, you know, still within that society. Uh, so if you're outside of that society and uh, there is no government there, then you'd just be, you know, voluntarily trading. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't be illegal. Uh, right, you know, the, right. the world wouldn't blow up, a socialist. Uh, so, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's just kind of it. <laughs> right, and it would be real free trade, not uh, not a NAFTA or GATT type of thing, which is just fascism. It would be real free trade, right? My, uh, you know, my uh, pigs or whatever for your geese or, or whatever we're, we're trading in, right? Um, that That's just kind of it. And whatever arises is money, because remember, the origins of money are organic. They are not a product of legislation and so forth, like Carl Menger pointed out in the 19th century and whatnot. Um, and that was before Mises came up with his regression theorem, about the, which was a more refined explanation about the origins of money. So yeah, so people on these voluntary floating associations, whether they're engaging in direct barter or they're engaging in indirect barter using money as a medium of exchange – 
uh, in order to overcome the problems of the indivi- uh, the problem of indivisibility as well as the double coincidence of wants. Uh, to f- so it, the money is used to facilitate transactions a lot more easy, uh, a lot easier, and all that. Uh, and especially considering that maybe there's not as many people on the water full time as there are people on land full time, then yeah, money is actually going to be a lot more important. Because you just simply have less people, at least at least initially to start out with. Uh, however, I'm not. Uh, it would not be outside the realm of possibility, Shane, that as the American police state continues to metastasize, that uh, more and more people would uh, seriously consider living on the water more full time, if if uh, anything, to lighten the boot on their necks. Right, right, and I guess yeah. I guess one of their notes is uh, you consider the uh, the vast amount of uh, oceans out there. And, uh, you know, even even if like uh, it would just hypothetically say that, uh, you know, even just like 5 percent of the U.S. population, that's a lot of people just, uh, you know, decide to move out on their boats. I mean, yeah, you know, they'd probably, you know, be a little, uh, you know, be, be a little worried, I'd imagine. But uh, how are they going to patrol that? There's no way in hell that they can. There's I mean, I mean, yeah, the state's going to use a balance if it wants to. But at the same time, you consider, you know, just the, the difficulty they have and, in, in, you know, uh, just patrolling, you know, land. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know how much you times that by, but like times it by, you know, tens of thousands. And uh, then you have the ocean. There's no way they could patrol that anyways. So, uh, so yeah, I think it's a very, very, as I've said before, I think it's, it's uh, I think, you know, we're going to see a lot of uh, pioneers and free, freedom pioneers, you know, take the open ocean. Right. And as a further note on something you just said regarding, um, you know, the, the, <laughs> the possibility of the bludgies uh, discovering, uh, the new ones or, or whomever else. Consider this, folks. The cops on land who go up and down the roads in their predatory and parasitic manner, you know, doing traffic stops and whatever else, they're creatures of either the municipal government, the county government, or the state government. They are not creatures of the federal government. Right. The Coast Guard, whom I'm assuming would be the bludgies mainly uh, at most harassing the uh, uh, people on the water and in extreme situations, maybe even the U.S. Navy, um, both the Coast Guard and the Navy are creatures of the federal government. And see, which American government is oppressing you, depending on what activities you're engaging in or the context of you know, driving a car versus sailing in a boat, uh, can actually make a difference in terms of how effective their so-called enforcement of the so-called laws actually is. What I'm trying to say is this. It could be argued that in some circumstances – the non-federal American governments, uh, state, county, municipal, are actually more effective at running a police state than the feds are in, so, in, in certain areas. So right. in terms of the Coast Guard trying to, and maybe the Navy trying to oppress people, um, they may be able, uh, occasionally they may, they may be able to snag people uh, trading in cannabis or whatever else, uh, victimless, uh, whatever the heck, but they can't get everybody. And heck, they probably can't get even most people. And, no, uh, no, they, 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 they certainly can't. And, and yeah, if you're outside the exclusive economic zone, you don't got to worry about marijuana laws. Uh, <laughs> and probably even within the within the exclusive economic zone, as long as it's not, uh, you know, uh, I guess fiscally, you know, if, as long as you're not, uh, you know, a, a large, you know, operation, um, as long as you stay concealed, uh, I don't think you'd really have to worry about that at all either. Uh, but then again, then again, you know, uh, this is just kind of me trying to me reasoning this out. It's not, uh, you know, from personal experience. So, uh, so yeah, if uh, I'll, I'll, I do plan on, you know, talking to more folks, you know, uh, interviewing them on my other podcast about their kind of experiences on the water and uh, kind of get some of those things, get get some actual real world examples. Or, you know, we can just research for season three. That would work, too. Or, hell, maybe we should interview one or two of those people for season three. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> But, but yeah, uh, but, yeah, go ahead. No, but 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 kind of to kind of segue into into the next quote a little bit. You know, it was just kind of interesting some of that footage of some of those couples on their on their boats and all that where they were showing like, "Oh, here's our bed and here's our kitchen and like the small amount of room that they have." Like you cannot Shane, I don't know about you, man, but I don't see how anybody uh, within a typical uh, residence within the servile society uh, could actually fit all of their possessions into those boats. I don't see how that's even possible. Oh, there's yeah, there's there, there's no way, there's no way. But uh, quote: "Limit possessions to what you can move, discard, or cache. For housing, choose a yacht over a house, or if you prefer to live on dry land, rent. For land transportation, use a motorcycle and old jalopy, or rented vehicles." End quote. So yeah, there's not a lot of room, and uh, you guys heard that uh, that's that, uh, 
clip that brought in uh, brought in the episode. Uh, I mean, yeah, she talked about that. She talked about how you know there's food kind of stored everywhere. She she had to uh, she got rid of everything except for the stuff that she absolutely needed, and uh, she uh, left some storage for their parents or something. But uh, you look on that boat and there's not a whole lot of like it's pretty much you know the boating gear, which I mean some of that stuff can can get pretty uh, you know uh, large I'd imagine. Uh, and then pretty pretty much just the necessities. And she also had a cat too, which I thought was pretty pretty neat. But uh, uh, but yeah, there wasn't a whole lot on there. There wasn't a whole lot on there at all. There's no there's nowhere to put it. Yeah, every pretty much in in that footage, it was pretty much everything has a place, everything in its place, and everything has a place, and not much more else. Of course, they need space to move their physical bodies from like you know the lower decks to the top deck or whatever else. But aside from that, I mean that place was packed with just stuff that they need to survive on. Yes, yes, and 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 obviously. A lot of that that stuff all has to fit into the cabin and the storage surrounding it. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's a lot of it. You know, don't want don't want your clothes to get soaked, or your bedding to get soaked, or anything like that. So yeah, you pretty much got to fit all that into a small little cabin, uh, depending upon the boat that you get. So yeah, minimalism plays a huge role uh, in minimalist sailboating, kind of you know by the title. Uh, it's absolutely crucial. As you know, I mean, I can bring my drub set onto the boat. I have to sell that. Uh, I mean, you just look at just just look around your house right now, and just think about all the stuff you'd have to get rid of. Uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that you'd be able to fit on a boat. Uh, I, I don't know. There's, there, I'd have to get rid of most everything. <laughs> yeah, and and I would just kind of say this. I mean, obviously, uh, later in this season, we'll we'll have the episode on van nomadism. I would just kind of suggest this: people who've had to live in very, uh, sp in some sense, space restrictive environments of one kind or another, would probably be have a have a greater probability of success, at least in some sense. Uh, living full time on a sailboat because if you don't have a lot of like um, square footage, then you learn how to be very very efficient. You either like some techniques involve things, and I think this was in the case on that footage that that you and I saw where uh, that couple was basically like stacking. They were making use of like vertical space. They were kind of right. like stacking things up, or they or there was like uh, cabinets that were closer to the roof or or the, or the ceiling or whatever. Um, of the lower decks rather than actually like near the floor or whatever. So, I mean, there was all sorts of techniques, uh, very clever storage solutions, like how some self-appointed professionals uh, who uh, who specialize in decluttering people's, you know, McMansions in the Serval Society and all that would, would call it. Uh, however, some of those uh, storage solutions actually would have a very practical purpose in terms of making sure that you have what you need to survive on when you're living on a boat full time. So it does have its place. Right, right. You can spend as much, obviously you can spend as much money as you want to on anything, right? I mean, someone will take it. Uh, you can spend as much or as little as you want to on your boat. Uh, so, I mean, it could be it could be very, you know, uh, uh, you know, intricate. It could be, you know, have just like the, the coolest storage places, you know, come from, come, you know, come from the factory. Or, I mean, you can obviously make modifications yourself. Uh, and I actually do have a book. It's called The Live Aboard Book. It was recommended by Rayo. And it's uh, you know, about 250 pages, and it's from this uh, this lady who uh, she lived on her boat for like 20 years. So she goes into a lot of that stuff. I uh, should have read that book before now, but uh, anyways, anyways, there's a lot of material out there on uh, a lot of material out there on you know kind of those um, those you know very important details as far as you know well what what do I need to bring onto the boat? Well, there's solutions out there. So uh, and I'll I'll link to a couple of those in the show notes, but. Uh, Let's get through this last quote from Vani, the search for personal freedom, and then we'll get to, uh, you know, uh, what Rayo had to say about sailboating in the Vani life, March 1973. So, quote, if you wish to battle a state through political agitation or overt civil disobedience, fight where you know the territory, in your native land, or a country picked with that in mind. But when you seek a haven from the storm, quietly comply with or bypass local laws. If your state of anchorage becomes intolerable, don't waste energy in extended public criticism or conflict. Apply your free market principles by setting sail for sunnier waters. End quote. Now, last, those are like last 10 words are my favorite ones from that entire book. Apply your free market principles by setting sail for sunnier waters. Uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously that's that's right. Yeah, if, if you're going to be moving somewhere, it's kind of, uh, I mentioned uh, Pete Sisko when you're talking about country shopping. And, uh, you know, he kind of he kind of made the same observation. It's, it's not worth it. If, if you're going to... Um, you know, be moving a lot. It doesn't really matter. You know what the politics of that of that government are, right? You have no influence on it anyways. Not that you do if you live in that country, but uh, <laughs> but anyways, yeah, just just not really concerned. Not really concerned if you're going to be uh, you know minimal sailboating. You know, forget about government completely, uh, except for you know when you do have to interact with the Serval Society. 
Yeah, and and there's a lot of wisdom in that. And so even for people who choose not to do the country shopping more more broadly or the minimalist sailboating more more specifically, uh, you shouldn't really have much invested in the survival society anyway, right? Because of much of what we said in season one, like the controlled schizophrenia, the political crusading, the collective movementism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, I think what Pete Sisko was kind of more getting at uh, what was more the idea of if you are actually doing uh, the country shopping, for example, and you're just kind of moving around, you have even less of an incentive to care about the local politics of whatever nation state government you're dealing with. Uh, you know, even less incentive than the true non-incentive that you had before. So it's almost like having kind of going into the negative uh, in a manner of speaking mathematically, yeah, right? It- yeah, and plus, if someone's going to be sailing, I mean, it's it's the United Nations that puts forth these, you know, like, it's yeah. the United Nations laws. So, like, it, it, if there was going to be political crusading, I mean, people would have to be, you know, lobbying the United Nations. It, I really hope, if, you, if you're pursuing Vani, if you're pursuing Vani, please don't lobby the United Nations. Like, please, <laughs> dear God, don't lobby the United Nations for, you know, more freedom on the open ocean. Just say, don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, <laughs> so, so, yeah, I think those are those are all good points. Yeah, and and so I, I think the idea of setting sail for sunnier waters, as is this episode, episode's uh, subtitle is, I think is really kind of the heart and soul of it, that one way of going about country shopping is through minimalist sailboating. And I, I think that's – this is a real form of direct action, ladies and gentlemen. I mean this is something you can do. The technology is there. The means are there. But then, of course, there's also the very uncomfortable question of why don't more people do it? I would suspect one reason is they simply just don't know that it's even a real option. I would also take a gander that another reason is people know about it, but then they write it off for one reason or another. And I would even say a third reason is even if they know about it, even if they're not inclined to write it off, they somehow in their stereotypical political activist, really more collective movementism type sense, are saying that, well, how would be living you know, minimally on a sailboat, you know, solve the pro solve political corruption? And then, you know, even kind of asking questions well, like that. What, it's, what about America? I've got, yeah, I've, got to, I've still got to vote in things. I can't just go live on a boat. Oh, you American patriots, you, yes. Uh, oh, you're running away. Actually, seriously, Shane, that was in private conversations when I was kind of mentioning this stuff from the Vanu book uh, with with several of them. Uh, the one response I kept getting from at least five of them, uh, whom I will not name here to protect the guilty, of course, uh, was, uh, well, you're abandoning America. You're running away. That's not what patriots do. We're here to f- stay and fight. And, of course, yeah, by enjoy, fight— Enjoy your time in prison. You know, it's all, it's all you know— uh... It's all self-inflicted. Mm-hmm. Well, either that or politically crusading for Trump, which seems to be like they're two different routes. So it's that's, either yeah, that's that's almost that's almost. I mean, yeah, government dungeons are bad, but you know, like the you know, patriots, you know, we got to defend America. Well, you know, President Trump. Uh, I don't know. I don't know which one's worse. They're both. Like, we'll just say they're equally bad. Yeah, and of course, as we said in, uh, in an earlier episode this season, you know, they're not sitting up committees of safety, which is what they should be doing according to their ideology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the fact when I brought up the minimalist sailboating, and it's like, okay, you guys aren't even setting up committees of safety, but you're going to lecture me in private conversations that minimalist sailboating is bad because it's quote unquote a form of running away. No, it yeah, is that, that as sounds, Rayo said. That sounds, uh, that sounds a lot like uh, Conkin retreat it. Or actually, no, it was uh, Rothbard who called uh, who called him retreatist. Yeah. And then it was uh, Sam Conkin who, uh, you know, the uh, anarcho Zionism, the uh, seeking the promised land of liberty. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, yeah, the you know, I mean, Conkin and uh, Rothbard, you know, are or more liked uh, with the with the uh, patriots. Uh, then you know I would like to admit here. <laughs> well, and and to be f- and to be just perfectly honest here in terms of the history, you know Rothbard was a political crusader. Uh, Konkin thankfully was not, but Konkin also wanted to tackle the state head on uh, through um, essentially the same thing as ethical enclaves, right? He thought that black and gray market trading would would abolish the state, as we covered in that previous episode in depth on on ethical enclaves. Uh, but the idea here with minimalist sailboating is you're changing, as is, as is with the case with much of Vanu, the idea here is to basically change your lifestyle in such a way that, you know, whatever the laws and whatever else happen to be of the moment, it really doesn't matter because you have a practical impediment to tyranny. You have an invulnerability to coercion. 
And that is something not a lot of people can still conceive of because they're still thinking in terms of, of liberty and freedom. They're thinking in terms of either a complete absence of coercion or they're thinking of a general exemption from coercion, but they're not thinking about an invulnerability to coercion. So we don't need more laws. We don't need more political crusading. Let's repeal the laws in New Hampshire routine one more time. No, what we need are practical impediments, whether that takes the form of public key cryptography or, as is the case here uh, with this episode, uh, minimalist sailboating, where, yeah, if you apply your free market principles by setting sail for sunnier waters, then the tyrants from the place you just left don't have a justifiable reason to go pursue you. Um, at, at least not easily, right? I mean, the only they would have to like portray you as like a drug kingpin or something. Uh, and yeah, or, even or then, that you, would be a bit of a stretch. You, or if you didn't file income taxes or something, they might. Uh, <clears throat> although, yeah, they, they may notice, they may not. I mean, they're 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 incompetent, but uh, you know, they there'd be there it'd be very very diff the point is it'd be very very difficult for them to you know. Yeah, unless you're like a wanted fugitive. Uh, yeah, I think it'd be pretty easy just to. Well, there's actually yeah, no restraints at all. You buy yourself a boat and go float around. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah, there's there's yeah there's there's really no restraints at all. I mean, obviously there's those those couple of legal interstices, but uh, uh, but but yeah, I mean it's 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 accessible. It's it's there, and it's not going away. Yeah, and so I know there are people who have always been worried, or especially since the so-called Great Recession, about, oh, the banks are going to take my home or whatever. And it's kind of like, well, you know what? If you were living on a boat full time, you wouldn't be living in a house anyway that would be subject to a mortgage or whatever other government regulations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, there's no house for them to steal or to trick you into investing in, and then you were an idiot and whatever else, and then you end up, quote unquote, losing it. Well, if you own the boat, free and clear, and I would assume a boat, even though arguably more expensive uh, on average than a car or van, would still be less, the boat itself would still be less expensive than a house. So assuming that to be the case, then what's the excuse again for not living on the boat full time? Hey, I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm obviously, you know, we both subscribe to the Austri Austrian economics. So, you know, maybe subjective value. Maybe it's not appealing to them. Uh, uh -huh. Which, you know, that's that's you know that that's okay. There are plenty of other strategies. You know, I understand yep. that. Yep. Uh, but for those who, uh, you know, just, um, you know, just, I guess all the all the excuses you've kind of laid out already. I mean, for them, I mean, they aren't going to be pursuing direct action anyway. So screw them. Uh, what they do does not affect us at all. That's uh, and that's kind of the makes, idea. It makes no damn difference whatsoever. So yeah, so if there's a housing collapse in the in the state of servile society, uh, if there's an increase in the income tax in Illinois, uh, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. If, if if it's happening and you're on a boat, you don't give a damn. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. You right. just don't. And much with the rest of Vanu, it doesn't affect you if you're actually using these different forms of direct action to make yourself invulnerable to coercion. And so, kind of, I know I mentioned this on previous episodes. It bears repeating here again. Uh, especially for any newer listeners where this very well might be the first episode you listen to. Uh, yeah, if you change your lifestyle to such an extent to where you have practical impediments to tyranny, then yeah, other people in the servile society can and will get hurt through their own voluntary choices in large part. Sometimes it'll be really coercive, but other time, but a lot of it is is enabled by voluntary. See, that's another thing too, not to get too philosophical here because we did that mainly during season one, right? But to reiterate the point, a lot of coercion that happens to people was directly enabled by their own voluntary choices that they made earlier. In other words, earlier voluntary choices set the stage to enable future coercion. So as a way of making voluntary choices now before the hammer comes down, maybe instead of investing you know, 30 years of your life in a crappy house that you won't even like anyway 20 years in or even sooner, maybe like get a boat and live in a boat. And you can have like new. I, I, hey, Shane, I think I think this was said by like a, a maybe a different sailboating couple, but I think they said something along the lines of when they were interviewed, uh, something along the lines of like, well, every morning when we wake up, we have a new vista, we have a new uh, view uh, that no amount of money could buy, or if right. you could, it would be like millions of dollars worth, right? Right. So you know, there, there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat here. And the fact that people were that some people are not willing for whatever reason to get out of uh, HOAs or other types of restricting housing situations uh, really kind of shows where their values are, isn't it? Instead of actually ponying up and trying something like minimalist sailboating. 
But yeah, Kyle, there are, there are a lot of excuses, uh, and, and you know, I, I do, you know, I, I do sympathize with at least with at least some of them. You know, luckily for me, you know, I, I you know, came to anarchism and you know found uh, found Vanu, you know, uh, early early on in my life. Uh, but you know, I, I do understand for like some 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 older folks who you know like their tentacles are so ingrained uh, in the state of survival society, whether it's modern banking, whether it's um, uh, whatever it is, whatever it is, you know, maybe they own a lot of land or, or something along the own a lot of land. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that, like they're, they're like that's that's obviously you know I sympathize with I sympathize with that sort of thing. Um, but obviously, you know, they're, they're for, for those folks, there's still there's still options available. And I actually, there are actually, I know I know some listeners uh, distinctly that uh, you know aren't similar positions, but they still uh, you know are trying to pursue Vanu. Uh, so obviously, there are you know certain life situations uh, and. You know, especially if you're, you know, 50 years old and you've got three kids living at home or whatever it is. I mean, obviously there, there are uh, the, the, the situations will vary, uh, but I, but I don't think that's, uh, you know, as any excuse not to at least, you know, try to make yourself more invulnerable to coercion and also keep your family safe too, right? Uh, so I, 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 I get, I get it, I get some excuses to a certain degree, but, uh, but, but the point is, if if someone wants to increase their own personal freedom, if they want to make themselves more invulnerable to coercion, they will take the steps necessary. Uh, to do so. Yeah. And to kind of build on top of that, I remember another time I was talking privately with actually a lady patriot and a uh, limited government type, uh, allegedly. And, you know, it was interesting. I, I mentioned the sailboating thing to her, too. And the only thing she really said was interesting idea. So she didn't like completely shoot it down like the others did. But she did say this. Uh, but I have a medical condition. Because, you know, she's former military and such. And all I could think was like, oh, God, really? I mean, it's it's kind of like, I, I don't know what to say at that point. Again, not all options are going to be available to all people equally. But at the same time, it's just kind of like, you know, if you don't want to do something, you can easily find excuses, some credible, some not so credible, to not do something. No, that, no that's that, that's certainly true. And I mean, that that's that's kind of been the major obstacle for me as far as, you know, trying to decide what I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, I've already got I've already got my kind of like five year plan laid out, but I don't know what I'm gonna do <laughs> when I'm forty or fifty. Um, I I don't know. You know I'm gonna explore these options and learn more and you know take steps that I can now, uh, and you know in the next five years. But uh, but you know that is something that 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 does that does linger. It's like well how am I get, how am I gonna get insulin? How am I going to get my test strips? How am I going to get my my insulin site uh, materials? How am I gonna get that if I'm living full time on the ocean? Uh, there are solutions to it. I know there are. I know there are, but before I even look into that, <laughs> I need to figure out, I need to actually, and what I'm going to do is within the next year or so, there are uh, 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 hitch sailing groups on Facebook, on fascist book, and uh, I'm going to, uh, you know, fly out to some location where someone is, and I'm just going to hitch sail with them, you know, for a few weeks or a month. I actually calculated out, someone was, uh, he, some guy, you know, looks for people to, you know, travel with him, and uh, it would cost, uh, I think it came out to like, uh, Two hundred dollars for two weeks, and then That's you just pay for you just pay for your food and um and and you kind of you obviously you work there too like you're helping him with the sales and such, but like it was like two hundred dollars for like two weeks or something. And I was like, holy hell, that's not bad at all like, for a vacation. That's... So like I was thinking, yeah. okay, so, so like a plane ticket, depending on where you have to go. I mean, probably hope you know, preferably someone you know in the United States. Um, that's obviously what what I'd be looking for, um, and you know. You might not have to pay that at all. I mean, you might just have to cover your own costs. I mean, there are a lot of options there. People are they may be looking for uh, you know uh, you know skilled deck help. They may be looking for someone like, hey, I just need you know a grunt here to you know push some levers and pull some sails around. Uh, I mean, you, you might be able to just get on there for free and just cover your costs. Um, so like, there's real possibility there. And obviously, before before I would recommend this to anyone. This is what I'm gonna do myself. Is before you actually you know make one of these radical lifestyle changes, try it first. Don't drop everything and pursue van nomadism without, you know, taking, you know, a three mile, you know, road trip uh, across the United States or something. Right. Um, you know, actually, you test out before to see if you actually like it rather than, you know, like me, me, like me, you know, just, you know, taking out a loan for a boat and uh, then, you know, finding out that, oh, shit, I don't like this that much. Uh, well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> so I guess that, that's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, I, one thing I've kind of noticed, I'll develop what you just said. I've noticed way too many people in the survival society with anything, whether it's direct action or even just more arguably typical things for themselves, that there's a real – I think this is more of a cultural norm I've noticed. 
they have a tendency that whenever anybody suggests anything at all, they want they're kind of evaluating it in the context of well, if I just kind of abandon whatever the heck I, heck I was doing before and I just dive head first into this thing, is it worth it? The payoff worth it? And and, and apply it not that to go too off topic, but it also applies to like romance too, or even just you know hooking up. They they kind of view it the same way. Comes down to time preference again, doesn't it? that's part of it, but it's not even in the sense of test driving. It's more in the sense of just kind of throwing themselves, you know, onto, uh, you know, uh, over the cliff and seeing how far they fall. Um, it, it's about that bad. They don't actually try to like peer over the edge and see, okay, is it, am I falling five feet or 500 feet kind of thing? Um, it's, it's, and, and, and don't get me wrong, some people in the Survival Society do test drive, and they even test drive lovers and, and things like that, uh, but a lot of people just don't. They just kind of throw themselves willy-nilly. There, there is actually quite – and I don't know, maybe this, is, maybe this is more pronounced right here in Austin than, than other places I've lived, but there's quite a bit of recklessness. I've noticed, even from people I've I've known, just acquaintances and such. I mean, there, there's a lot of recklessness, whether it's with jobs or or, or family issues and, and so forth. And so, regarding minimalist sailboating, um, I do agree with you that if people want to kind of pursue this and give it a try, that they should well try it, not do the substantial lifestyle change, throw themselves into it, and then kind of figure out halfway through maybe this wasn't the best choice for them. No, test drive it first. And that hitch uh, of sailing you were mentioning ago might be one good way of doing that, where it's kind of like a temporary thing. I think you said, what, $200 for two weeks? Or were, that was for, for, for one guy. I mean, there's always, I mean, every single day I'll go in there and there'll be like three or four posts like, hey, I'm going from Spain to uh, Miami, uh, who wants to ride with me across the ocean? Uh, like there, there are a bunch of them every single day. And what I like about this group is it's a, it's, it's a few hundred, few hundred, few hundred people or thereabouts, and uh, it's a, it's a very close knit community. You can just tell. Uh, so, you know, uh, obviously, you know, I was raised, uh, I was raised in like the stranger danger sort of, you know, society. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, it, it, but you, you can, you can vet people, you know, th that way. Um, and, and also, you know, since you know. I mean, people are like, oh, yeah, I sailed with John, like, you know, last year. Oh, what a great guy. Like, you've, you've got, you know, like, you aren't going to meet up with some guy who's going to take you out there and, you know, kill you and toss you in the ocean. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's always that small small possibility. But but generally, like, you know, fr from what I've seen in this group, I mean, it's a close-knit community. If anyone's toxic or anyone's, uh, you know, if, if anyone were to, you know, defraud somebody, uh, yeah, they would be out for sure. Um, so it's it seems like a very, very good group. So if this is something you're interested in, uh, I'll post links. Actually, I'll post those in the uh, show notes uh, for for hitch sailing, uh, or hit, you type in hitch sailing uh, as a search or uh, live aboard. Uh, you'll you'll pull up a bunch of groups, and you know I I don't know why it took me long so long to find them, but uh, but yeah, that's and for for a lot cheaper too. I mean, you can spend you know 500, 500 bucks and uh, you know test it out rather than you know, drop forty thousand dollars on the boat. I mean, it's a no brainer. It really is a no brainer. And if you're still listening to this podcast, then uh, then I, I know you're smart enough uh, to, to, to figure that out. Uh, so <laughs> anything else there, Kyle? Uh, really, really just kind of kind of to say that, you know, maybe what Yoda said in the Star Wars movies is perhaps accurate. You know, there is no try, do or do not, right? Exactly, exactly. So we've got, um, and this will be new. If you haven't listened to Sunday's episode yet, you'll get a couple of quotes here. Actually, not Sunday's episode. Sunday's uh, just a, a bonus uh, post on the feed. But this one's from Vonnie Life, March 1973. It's titled 16 Ways to Live Freer, a Critical Evaluation by Our Boy Rayo. What do you have to say? Quote, worth consideration, get a boat. Quote, inside of a quote, life in a small boat with the simplest food and clothes is indeed free and easy. Go where and when you please. You have a sturdy, simple, not too expensive, and not too easily damaged boat you can leave tied places while you make side trips. Anchor among islands and eat fish. Tie up at a big city dock for $20 or so a month, and water, electricity, and garbage disposal is free. Stay along a river and grow a garden in the fertile, well-watered riverside floodland, and probably no one will bother you if you choose it well. Sail the world and travel. Want to hide? Lower the mast, push into the tools, and put some put some on your deck. End quote. Uh, Paul Dorr, actually, end quote, and end quote. Uh, Paul Dorr, Pioneer, page 222. So, I guess, a couple of things I, I noticed here... And that even even if you aren't going to, you know, take living, uh, you know, living on the open ocean to its, you know, for this extent, I mean, even there was a, uh, this will be kind of, this will be, I can't believe this is coming up in this episode or as part of the Vani podcast, but uh, back when I used to, you know, be really into gaming, a game called League of Legends, there's this guy who, uh, he's a really popular live streamer, 
and uh, he actually lived on a boat, uh, you know, in the marina out there in, you know, California. And apparently it was a really, really cheap way to live. So even if you are going to, uh, you know, uh, uh, even if you just want to make occasional forays into the ocean, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you find your, like, nice cove or something, and the rest you just want to kind of, you know, stay hampered down into a, into a, uh, a dock or something, uh, I mean, that might be a very affordable way uh, uh, to do so. Uh, very, very well might be. I mean, obviously, it would depend upon, you know, the, the rules and the interstices available uh, there where you're planning to do it. So obviously keep that in mind. But just a, just an option. And then uh, one other one. You know, I, I kind of thought of a, a business idea for somebody. Maybe someone's already doing this. I, I imagine someone is. It's, it's not very creative. But he says, stay along a river and grow a garden in, in uh, the fertile, well-watered riverside floodland. And probably no one will uh, bother you if you choose it well. Well, yeah, you could you could grow a lot of like on those islands. I mean, yeah, uh, obviously, you know, uh, in the United States and, you know, the highly populated areas or, you know, right outside of, you know, towns and things. Um, they do, you know, use satellite imaging and, and try to, you know, scour for some things, uh, you know, whether it's houses, you know, illicit substances or whatever. But out there in the ocean, you can do whatever you want to. Uh, it's just like on an island. If it's, it has, if it's not used by anybody, you could, you know, have a, a damn good garden out there. Um, and you could also, you know, my business idea here. Uh, actually not mine, not mine, just something I thought of, but, uh, you know, you could grow some, some, uh, illicit plants there on the island, you know, large amounts without any risk whatsoever, because you'd be outside of the 200 mile radius. Uh, as long as you were, you know, concealed, you know, use deception, uh, you could, you know, have some, some boats take that back there and you could probably make a, some quite a, quite a bit of money that way, but I don't know. Um, you'd be eliminating the risk on your end, but then the people that would be delivering would be incurring a lot of risk. So I don't know, just something I thought of, man. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, that that's that's kind of rather fascinating. But of course, conditions change. So obviously, the amount of of twenty dollars would not be accurate considering uh, for today would not be accurate considering the rate of inflation and so forth. But the point is still uh, taken well under advisement. Where living on a boat, like at a big city dock, could very well in some places be actually cheaper than living in even a cruddy uh, apartment. That's falling and, apart, and, and, and even even so more because uh, I, I there was uh, I went to uh, Isla Marias off of Cancun a few years ago, and then also even uh, uh, even uh, Ecuador, we were in a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a resort there, and there was a uh, marina, and uh, I'm guessing in a lot of those countries, it might actually still be that I mean, probably not that you've got to obviously adjust for inflation, but at the same time with some of, some of these impoverished countries, uh, you could probably you know make it by you know for for nothing. Uh, I, I would imagine be, it'd be extremely cheap. I don't know, though. <laughs> well, again, that uh, that would probably be uh, maybe something more for season three where we look more into the costs, the capital investment regarding the uh, <laughs> regarding the boat and the 20 million different details thereof. So maybe one episode on legal interstices regarding boats and then maybe another one on uh, capital investment regarding the boat and like what do you need to buy and, you know, how many life preservers do you need to have and so forth, right? Well, I don't even know. I don't even think we're qualified to speak on that subject. Uh, <laughs> we, we can do we can do some research and come out with some ideas, but uh, uh, but yeah, I would recommend you get into those groups on Facebook and just ask questions because I know like the, I, I've asked a lot of questions, they've always gotten answered. So uh, you know, very nice group of people, and uh, this is what they do. They live aboard their boat. So if you're gonna ask anybody, you know, don't ask us. Go ask them. We've never lived on a boat, uh, unfortunately, as, of, as, not, as uh, not not as of yet. Uh, but yeah, those groups are great for that sort of thing. Uh, so, so yeah, there's that. Yeah. And, and also, sorry, just, just one thing. And again, this might be more appropriate to go into season three in more detail, but you know, there's no reason why certain methods of Vanu cannot be combined with others. So, you know, if you think about it, you know, there, there are like the great lakes, right. But, um, I don't, if I'm trying to remember my history right, I don't think access to like the Atlantic Ocean is that particularly easy, and I don't think the Great Lakes are like directly connected to the Pacific Ocean. I don't think so, or at the very least, even if they are, it's you kind of have to like really kind of wind your way through Canada at least to some degree. Um, so what I'm trying to say is maybe if minimalist sail in some circumstances could be combined with something else, like maybe a little bit of van nomadism, especially if you have a trailer for the boat. Then that would be kind of like the modern version of like porting a boat, like what some of the uh, European explorers during the pre-colonial period did with the help of some of the friendly so-called Indians, where they would have to port the boats like between like major rivers like the Mississippi and wherever else. So that's kind of something else to consider. You know, just because we, um, you know, there there may be a particular Vanu method of van nomadism versus minimalist sailboating versus whatever else, there's no reason why these things can't be combined. 
in some circumstances. Just a thought. Oh yeah, for yeah, for for sure, for sure, and we'll we'll, we'll get more into that here. Um, but uh, but what, what Rayo has to say here is actually pretty profound. Well, actually, we're not gonna hear what he has to say yet. But uh, quote a contrary view quote inside of a quote. I have investigated the maritime scene, and my best advice is to forget it unless you need a tax write off. A boat is only a symbol of freedom. It was having a boat that taught me to hunger for freedom as a drowning man hungers for air. I'm reluctant to become involved with any with owning anything that requires the man's approval, registration, and licensing insurance and endless goods and services and quote uh dick pre inform 1968 to 1969 reprints also in this vein october 1972 motorboating has a long article on a on small boat regimentation and quote so that's an interesting contrary view uh especially you know from a vanuin uh i mean for the people that are are, are doing it that do it full-time now i mean uh you know there's there's probably a lot of them that, that feel that sort of freedom but probably not in the vein of vanu uh, so for this to actually, like, this was a contrary view that someone wrote to Rayo. And, uh, you know, they said that it made them want, it want freedom more, and they just despise so much having to, you know, do the flagging. Uh, and then, you'll, you'll, I mean, you'll, you'll probably, you'll, you'll have to get it, you know, registered somewhere and, you know, licensed, and I'm sure. And I'm just sure that's, that stuff goes along with it. But apparently that that's that process, you know, you know just, uh, you know, made uh, this, uh, made, uh, made John Smith over here, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. And I mean, just as, uh, you know, Van Nomadism wasn't enough for Rayo, you know, Wilderness Vani wasn't either. And from what I'm gathering now, Wilderness Vani wasn't enough for Rayo uh, either. Uh, he was more into the fully underground structures, uh, which uh, that'll come out more in the... Uh, when Vonnie Life March 1973 is fully digitized. But what do you have to say, Kyle? Well, I would just kind of say this, that there is kind of a spectrum here regarding the uh, the, the use of lawfare, the use of the government's own laws as a weapon of war against the citizenry and all that. So what I'm trying to say is this. If uh, the the lawfare in terms of you must have a license even for a war or whatever the other regulations are, if somebody finds those too oppressive or whatever – then I guess private cities and free isles and free ports and all that kind of stuff is also out the window too because they're even more uh, – there's there's even more of that kind of stuff regarding those kinds of things. So, you know, it's just kind of interesting. I mean you can pretty much look anywhere. So so what so so what does that – what does that leave that this individual with? I mean van nomadism, I mean you've got to have your mm -hmm. license and registration for mm -hmm. that too. Um, intentional community maybe, but then that comes with you know legal ownership of land. Um, that pretty much only leaves – wilderness vani well uh at, at least initially that would seem to be the case but then again this was before uber right i mean uh you could always contract out some of these functions uh at least at least in some sense you could contract these functions out to other people who are licensed by the state to do fill in the blank and you yourself are not. See, it's actually kind of interesting not to go on too long about a different topic, but if you ever notice people who are truly wealthy, I'm not talking about the so-called rich. I'm talking about people with actual real workable capital. People who are genuinely wealthy, generally speaking, well, they're kind of like a walking living example of the division of labor, right? Uh, their time and effort is worth more doing certain things rather than others. So, for example, instead of spending an hour downloading software into a computer that's privacy friendly, they just hire somebody else to go do it for them and whatnot. Um, and instead of driving themselves around to go do errands, they hire a, a chauffeur, or they may even hire like a personal grocery shopper person to kind of go do their errands for them in some sense, right? A personal assistant, right? And I'm kind of trying to kind of say the same thing here, that instead of dealing with the regulations directly of either driving a van or sailing a boat or whatever else, maybe they'll contract that out. They'll hire someone else, to kind of do all that for them and act uh, kind of as a, as an right, inter, yeah. wait, wait for it, a perhaps a professional intermediary of sorts between them and the government. See, that's what actual people with real capital who are not mindless actually do. Because I've known, I'll say this for the very first time publicly here, I have known people whose net worth is well in excess of six figures. And they are, most of them are nouveau riche. Um, they act very differently from most people in the servile society, and they only have are more cultural than anything else. Um, but yeah, they their entire way of looking. I mean, they're very entrepreneurial. Um, the only reason they would deal with corporate uh, entities is is because the government doesn't really give them a way out. 
but they're not like corporate manager types at all. They're like real entrepreneurs and the, and the, and the financially successful ones too, because they're financially independent. Right. Um, and so they act very differently. And one thing I kept noticing over and over and over again is that they contract out certain types of functions. So I know like the so-called 99% socialist types will get angry at what they term the so-called 1% uh, and, and whatever and whatnot. But you know what? Yes, there are uh, some bad people who did uh, get their wealth through uh, fascism and through government subsidies and largesse and, and lobbying and so forth. But then there's other people who earn their wealth uh, through justly acquired property by actually serving others in the marketplace. And those people, those real – uh, financially successful entrepreneurs usually do things like contracting out certain functions. And that's something a lot of people really still, uh, at least in the servile society, really don't understand. Like I've tried explaining this even to some of my coworkers, and they, it, it, it's literally in one ear, out the other. I mean, really, it's just kind of like, yeah, you can just contract out certain things. I mean, I even explain it this way, like a babysitter. Technically, that's a very mm, usually more bourgeois way of contracting out a certain function, right? Child rearing for an evening so you and your uh, spouse, presumably, uh, can go out and have a date and have some adult time without the children pesky, uh, being pesky on you for you know every minute of your life. Uh, that's a form of contracting out. So if you can understand get, hiring a babysitter for the evening for date night, you can understand hiring out people for other functions. So that would be another way in terms of the boating if if – the boating or even uh, getting a van or whatever is is too much of an imposition. Well, you could always hire them out. People do it all the time with Uber. Yes, yes, that that, that is true, and that'll tie in really nicely to um, something that'll probably happen a year from now, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, season three, when we talk about uh, you know vomiting in cities. Uh, that will come into play, yep. you know, very much so. Uh, there having you know professional you know professional um, intermediaries, as I think as you put it. Uh, you know, squeaky fucking clean, like they, like the, you know, the state looks at them and they say, that's a, that's a good American. <laughs> we like that guy. Uh, those are the types of folks that you want to, you know, you contract this stuff out to. But I was looking, I, I remembered what, it was part of the same article, but it, 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 it's something you said sparked a thought in me. Uh, but Rayo said, quote, one might use a boat for shelter and transportation, but most of the pros lease living space, travel on commercial airlines and rent equipment as they need it. A great variety of products from electronic test gear to earth moving machines can be rented in a large city, uh, which I thought was really like, so is he saying that, you know, most of the professional Vonnewins, you know, go like, they didn't go through the TSA back then. Um, like that's, so that's, that's interesting. So they lease living space. Mm -hmm. That makes, that makes sense. But travel on commercial airlines makes sense back then. I don't think it'd be very Vonnewin unless you had, you know, alternate, alternative identification, um, you know, nowadays. And even then, there's still, and even then, there's still the naked body scanners to deal with. Even if you were successfully paper tripping, so there's more, there's more than one kind of impediment uh, against us, not the other way around. Uh, that that the state really has kind of made those airports really not feasible. Because I mean, if you want to be coerced, go to an airport. You will see coercion every single day at an airport, and it's normal uh, business now post 9/11. Yep. yep, and I have to get every time I go through an airport now for my insulin pump, I have to get uh, you know the bomb test. It's nuts. It's absolutely and see, and nuts. See, yes, I get felt up, and then I get my fucking fingers swabbed because I have insulin on my in my pump. Apparently, that means I'm carrying a bomb onto a plane. What the fuck? Yeah, and, and and that's actually a good point. So if you were traveling by boat, I don't think those uh, alleged. No. Yeah, that no, security even, theater even, doesn't exist. No, no, no. Even even if um like like I've, I've men I mentioned you know, previously that uh, you know in some of these videos I've watched they've they've have they have had to you know go through you know certain regulations at ports. Oh, I don't think it's anything like it's not anything like that bad. It's not as sensationalized. It's not as you know. Ooh. It's not one of it's not one of the uh, you know you don't hear about ISIS coming in on boat. <laughs> uh, it's there's not that fear mongering there. Uh, so maybe oh. Maybe okay. Maybe it's time to you know set sail for sunnier waters sooner rather than later. Am I just giving my giving my idea? Damn. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm kind of saying. So notice that the security theater by the American police state is all about the airplanes, the airplanes, the airplanes since 9/11. But when was the last time a so-called terrorist attack was conducted by boat? And then look at the at the government security uh, regulations or procedures or whatever the heck regarding people who travel internationally by boat. 
I don't even think it's even relatively close to the freaking airplanes. So that's kind of no, interesting not, question. Not, I mean, maybe, maybe they search your boat. I, I mean, I, I wish I had, you know, firsthand experience on this. Maybe they would search your boat. But, you know, as far I, – I, I don't think it'd be anything near as bad. There's no possible way because there has to be a lot of money and there has to be a lot of outcry about it for, you know, that sort of thing to get funded, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that does not exist yet for boats. Um, so and maybe it never will. But 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 either way, I mean, you know, the the state, you know, the, the state is the state. And, you know, if they if they, you know, want to crack down on, you know, minimal sailboating, I'm sure they'll they'll, they'll try to find a way. But uh, then there will be uh, our friends in the black and gray markets that will help us uh, get on the open ocean. Right. So, of course. Uh, that's always good to know. <laughs> right. Right. Of course. And even and even with airplanes, I mean, consider something, too. Why aren't more people going by Cessna? I mean, there's even people who are more bourgeois that have gotten away from the, dare shall I call it, the might as well be public airplanes with with where yeah, you're dealing with like these former Air Force pilots, uh, now turned civilian pilots or whatever, versus, well, why not just do it yourself and like, you know, get a pilot's license yeah. yourself and take a Cessna? I mean, are those guys getting felt about the airports? I don't think so. So whether nope, I know for, I know for, I know for a fact that they do not. Yeah, yeah, so, nice. so, yeah. Uh, they, they they don't they they walk right onto the yeah, plane. Yeah, so whether it's people who are ridiculously wealthy and have private jets, whether it's more bourgeois type people who are piling a Cessna because they invested the time and effort in getting a pilot's license or whatever else, uh, or as is the case here with this episode, people who actually got in a friggin' boat and just live on it. Um, there's all sorts of these options to create practical impediments to being coerced, especially in terms of your freedom and exercising your freedom of movement. Oh man, the, the, the possibilities are endless. That's why, you know, I'm looking so much, and I'm on my, the episode I've been looking forward to for so long, and now I'm talking about looking forward to season three, <laughs> uh, developing these things is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's going to be more intensive, but you know, I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to it nonetheless. So, uh, let's get to this next quote here. Quote, my own comparison of boat and van. A boat costs roughly three times as much, counting labor if one builds one's own, as a van camper bus in similar condition with similar capacity. For short visits to cities, a van can be parked anywhere, at least for short times, not just in marinas. Waterways seem to be patrolled as much as are highways and roads, at least in North America. For remote living, there are many more miles of interior land than of the seacoast, and much of the coast is steep, rocky, and sparsely timbered, not suitable for a boat larger than a kayak. The wind is free, but maintenance can be expensive. Salt water is very corrosive. While a boat can potentially go anywhere there is water, crossing an ocean in a small boat is a major undertaking, not a routine trip. There are many different kinds of boats and many different lifestyles possible with boats. To someone interested, I suggest first trying a way of life with someone else's boat by being a crew member and sharing costs, end quote. So... Oh, man. So I, I guess that, that's, that's interesting. So I, I don't know if Ray ever... if. Um, Actually, he says waterways seem to be patrolled as much as our highways and roads, but I don't know if Vreo ever ventured out into the ocean. No, and uh, I, I, I really, I really, the last, the last I really kind of maybe know, and that's from Radicals for Capitalism, is that uh, he was, uh, he, he kind of um, started like the underground shelter thing. He was really into the ideas of underground shelters, you know, completely underground. Uh, so I think that that might have been as far as he got. I don't know if he ever bought a boat and tried it. Um, so maybe that's just kind of, uh, you know, well, they seem to be, you know, more patrolled and maybe they are around the contiguous zone. I, I, I don't know. I haven't been out to, you know, California or anywhere on the East coast for a while. So I don't know how much, how, how patrolled those are. I really have no idea. Yeah. That's first interesting observation. Um, and then beyond that, and, and he mentions too, that, you know, seacoast. I think he's only he's only really thinking of like living on the coast. And this is where John Fisher, I think, you know, eleven years later, kind of picked it up and said, "Hey, you don't have to be right on the coast. You can get out and get down and get out into international waters." So I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And this this is 1973. So this was like eleven months before Rayo disappeared. Is when he was talking about this. So I don't know, man. I I. I I don't know. I don't think he ever had had, had, had any direct experience with sailboating, and uh, I don't think he was, you know, thinking, you know, as far forward as John Fisher did in like 1984. So. Well, I mean, Rayo had direct experience with with a van nomadism, right? And that's that's kind of where his his one of his specialties was, and as we'll get into in a future episode this season. Uh, but yeah, I mean, look, unless somebody does a study, or unless there is a study out on this, and my email is kyle at vanupodcast.com if anybody wants to send me such study uh, on this. 
is uh, you know traffic stops by police bludgies on the roads versus searches and stops or whatever the equivalent is by the Coast Guard on boats. Because at that point, I mean, now we're just getting into a numbers game at that point. And um, unless there's some data that a, you know, a posteriori, you know, I can work with and look at some statistics and whatever else, unless there's actually some raw data to that that can be, you know, uh, analyzed, um, my a priori assumption would be, well, there are more people on the government roads than there are people on the international waters. Therefore, I would assume the enforcement on the roads would be much more severe and constant than would be like on the water and such because there's just less people. There's less people, therefore less bludgies. Right, right. And, and obviously you're you're aware of like uh, – I'm sure there's a main drag there in Austin where the cops are always sitting. and they know where that's where all the people are driving. Uh, and I'm sure there's similar places, similar places for boats too. But um, you know, outside of the, uh, you know, yeah. Re regardless, like if there's a if there's a main strip from, uh, I don't know. I I wish I I knew my tropical islands better. Uh, but like if uh, you were like if there is a common trip from you know somewhere to somewhere, and that was you know a very heavily trafficked area, then I would you know depending upon where that is, you know maybe the maybe the um, it's obvious it's guaranteed that. Uh, the government of that uh, country doesn't have as much money to uh, work with as uh, uh, the United States goons do. The bludgies there, um, or here rather. So I, I mean, I mean, I would still think uh, even more, even some of the more highly trafficked areas. If that was a concern, you could probably avoid those. Um, so I, I don't know, just kind of a thought that came to mind. There were there were a couple, like there were some recurring themes when I would like on my YouTube, you know, ventures of you know people sailboating. There's a really common path somewhere. But it, I mean, it's it's still wide open ocean. I mean, you might see like one other boat there. So I don't think it would be worth that. Worth like, what were they going to sit on the ocean at that one point and just like uh, you know hit random boats? I don't think it's worth their time. <laughs> I don't think that I don't think they're going to do that. Yeah, I, I think I think it it, it 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 not not you know it all, not only leans. I think it's you know far in favor of sailboating versus man nomadism uh, when it comes to bludgeoning interference. Yeah, and, and and that would you know a priori seem to be the case. So unless uh, some listeners or whomever else wants to send me an actual real study on enforcement of traffic stops on land versus uh, coast by the uh, stops by the coast guard, again my email is kyle at vanupodcast dot com. Uh, for people who want to send me links or the actual document as an attachment or whatever else, uh, you know, I'll be happy to take a look at that. But unless somebody's actually done that, I'm just going to go ahead and assume that the enforcement is, on the water is nowhere even close to the traffic stops on the land, which is actually something I'm much more familiar with because I wrote, uh, you know, that article about it, right, as part of that larger series on right to travel and so forth, especially on land. So that's kind of rather interesting. And I don't think that's a question that's really been kind of uh, broached really in, in the alternative media anywhere is, you know, is it, let me put it this way, is it safer to travel by one me uh, form by, uh, you know, <laughs> trust plane or airplane, right, that old phrase, uh, by one form rather than another. And I would posit that it is safer, at least at this juncture, it is safer to travel by boat than it would be by car. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any way it could be. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's pretty safe to say. I think that's pretty safe to, safe to say, and I'm guessing we're going to have to do a lot of original research for, for Season 3 mm -hmm. on you know, a lot of different things for, for minimal sailboating, uh, but that, uh, that uh, being just one of them. So, yep. All right, and uh, also from the same publication, Vinyl Life, March 1973, um, this is, you know, only this is by Paul Doerr, uh, titled A Small Boat for Live Aboard. Uh, so, yeah, not by Rayo, but, uh, you know, maybe some suggestions that, uh, you know, might, uh, you know, at least, you know, prepare you for season three. So let's, uh, it's very short, very short. So I'm reading it from the actual original publication. I haven't gotten to this point yet, so the text is small. Uh, <laughs> all right, quote, soon, maybe the top, maybe by the time you read this, I will be living in a small boat. I came to California from Lake Erie in an 18 foot sloop, but sold it as too cramped, even for one. I hope to leave there with a good companion. So I made a list of what I did and didn't want, designed it all into 25 feet and built it. My new boat is turtle deck for water shedding and more headroom below. Double and double end for better sea characteristics. Twin keel for shallow water and cross ocean sailing. Freestanding, stayless but stowable. Short mast for no jibbing. 
Twin keel for shallow water and cross ocean sailing. Freestanding, stayless but stowable. Short mast for no jibbing. Sail wear, better sailing characteristics and capability to stow all gear, including the mast and the locked cabin. Three compartments, one about 12 feet long to live in and two to store stuff in and out of the way. Positive, poured in place flotation so I can't sink. Diamonded, an ancient Chinese invention. Barn door rudder for better control and less turbulence. Hand tiller for simplicity, the less fancy, the less likely to break. Chinese junk type sail rig, another ancient Chinese invention, the most efficient, durable, least expensive in the long run, easiest handling sail known. Water tanks below and on floor to store enough water for some months at sea. Also, the water adds ballast on the keel while sailing. Dry food stored in plastic containers to provide additional life preserver type flotation. A built-in treadle sewing machine, foot operated for sale and clothes repair. Kerosene lights to independence on electricity. A wood-burning pot-bellied stove so I can cook and heat with driftwood or wood I cut on shore. Two heavy posts, one at either end so I can use the anchor rope. A block and tackle and a buried anchor to drag the boat up onto the shore if I find a place where I want to stay for a while. All fittings through bolted so nothing will break out in a storm, etc. Solid mahogany frames and stringers. Two layers of 3 inch plywood and one layer of fiberglass over all. On hole and deck for strength. A doghouse sliding or solid over the cockpit so I can sail in comfort in bad weather. I like to find several boats to sail in company, perhaps all over the world, keeping together during nights and storms by using CB radio as a sort of rough distance direction indicator and free communications, of course. By someone always watching the fleet while others are ashore, nothing will be lost or damaged. Foods can be bought in quantity and divided among the fleet. Uh, reprinted from Pioneer, page 222, end quote. So I guess just one, one observation there, Kyle. With that article, just it's one continuous sentence with just semicolons all the way down. Wow. So, yeah, that's that's what it is. So it was a little, little difficult to read, and obviously the small font too. But uh, anyways, anyways. Uh, so what, what he kind of laid out, what Mr. Uh, Mr. Dorr kind of laid out was just, uh, you know, here's what he's doing with his boat, uh, you know, so he can, you know, start sailing. Uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> that's pretty much it. Well, it was kind of interesting, two, two things that were kind of brought up by, uh, by him. One was the use of CB radio, so people can contact each other. And, you know, such would probably also be the case today, because I don't know if the, uh, that we could do everything by cell phone or smartphone or whatever it all is, because the cell phone towers probably wouldn't reach out that far. I mean, unless you're out the coastline, I suppose. Um, so the CB radios would still be relevant, especially if you're, like, out at sea, like, really out, like, you know, beyond 200 miles, right? Um, and I don't know how so the, how far those cell phone towers can can reach out to, right? I mean, even if you're at that 20 mile mark or or or, or even 30 miles out, right? Um, it all it all depends on the weather. If it's uh, if it's you know flat and clear, 25 miles out off the shore, um, so out of the contiguous. Oh, well, actually no, still in, still just in the contiguous zone. Uh, but it pretty much depends upon the weather. And if it, if it's clear skies, you can you can get it. I, the guy said you know up to like 30 miles. He's he's been able to do like a video live stream. Um, mm -hmm. it just depends if it, but if it's, you know, a terrible night, you know, high waves and all of that interference, uh, yeah, it's, it's not going to happen. Um, so that leaves satellite phone, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess cell phones can't solve every problem with, oh, there's an app for that. Well, I guess there's certain limits to that because of course, some of the crypto anarchists don't like me mentioning that in private conversations and such that cell phones can't solve every problem. That's before we even get into the wiretapping stuff. Um, the other thing I thought that was interesting that uh, he mentioned in his article was that it might be possible in some situations to kind of like buy food in bulk and then kind of divide it up amongst mm -hmm. the fleet and all that. That's interesting. That's kind of like almost suggesting kind of like a, a temporary version of like a food co-op. But like specifically for the people living on their on their boats full time. That's kind of an interesting idea. Kind of having a food co-op. It, it co -op. is. And if, if, like, yeah, if, if you've got like, uh, you know, four or five families – and you're all buying like a hundred, I don't know, just throw out a random number, hundred pounds of grain. So you buy 400 instead of 100, you'll get it, disc like, you know, you get discounts and things in bulk. So yeah, that makes complete sense. And it would actually be very economical too. Yeah, of course, barring that, uh, I guess the next best thing may be what, Costco? <laughs> but of course, that's right, that, that... right. Or Amazon. Oh. <laughs> or, oh, oh man, this brings up, oh, what, so what if, um, oh man, oh man. I wonder if you could give like your uh, so so you know like Amazon what they were they were trying they were gonna start sending out the drones like for deliveries. Mm -hmm. um, I I haven't heard from that heard about that in a long time. I'm guessing they're you know getting a little some run-ins with the FCC or would it be that uh, it wouldn't be the FCC it'd be the uh, oh, FAA uh, FAA 
wrong alphabet agency. <laughs> my fault, guys. Wrong, wrong um, bureaucracy, but it's still kind of the more sa- 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 <laughs> some of the same old administrative agencies, fourth branch of government, all that. As Senator Patrick McCarran called yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, but what if you know, like, like maybe you know, 15 or 20 years from now, or maybe it shouldn't even be that long. I mean, drones are like the technology's here and they're cheap. Uh, you know, like, uh, like if, if Amazon would, uh, you know, send a, uh, like out from, you know, California, if you're a hundred miles off into the ocean, give them your, you know, your latitude and longitude and have something actually delivered out to you by drone. Like that would be, that would like revolutionize everything, like even further than it already kind of is. Right. Uh, that would be crazy. You know, Ray talked about telecommunications and freighting. Imagine if you're out in the open ocean and Amazon can deliver you something with a drone. That that would definitely be one way of doing it, I suppose. But then again, if you need to go into the cities to do your import export or whatever, if you're already there, then the other business right, model right. would would kind of you know if you and your um, you know if you and your buddies basically want to kind of do all your purchases on like one. So let me put it this way. So instead of everybody like getting their own Costco membership card, if you had just had one part, one guy in your fleet have that Costco membership card and you just agree on like a certain day of the week or whatever it is, you you know, you all go in and then you all throw your stuff in there and you have multiple cards or whatever. Like, Hey, you know, this is on one member's card. I mean, I don't know if they would necessarily let you do that, but it would be an interesting experiment to try. I, I don't think they would care. They want your they want your fifty dollars a year membership fee or something like that. No, if you're spending money there, they don't care as long as you have a card. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> so, as far yeah, as far as I understand. So it. if you had your own kind of informal f- food co-op for your full time sailboating fleet, and let's say you had five members, then I guess you could have five members with five cards, and only one of them would need the Costco membership card, and that reduces cost for everybody. Um, I don't know if they would necessarily. Yeah, it costs them. Cost them if, it, if it is fifty, I think it's around fifty dollars a year. I might be wrong on that, but you get ten dollars a person. <laughs> Hell, that's worth it. Yeah. See, 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 see that. So you see, folks, there's definitely more than one way of skinning a cat here. Um, but yeah, that's just uh, something that just kind of popped in my head there with uh, a possible food co-op idea with living on a sailboat full time. Yeah, yeah, and I guess one other one other option. Uh, you know, Ray did factor in the work, uh, but this uh, Mr. Door. Uh, D-O-E-R-R, his uh, kind of strategy was just uh, he knew what he needed, he knew what he needed on the boat, uh, and he built the boat to fit his needs. Uh, so if that's kind of you, if you're more of like a you know carpenter engineer type, uh, I mean, yeah, you could build your own boat. I don't know how long that would take. I don't know what would go into it. It'd be a lot of work. I know that. Uh, but uh, that is an option. And, you know, always buying, uh, you, you can always buy like, uh, actually, just before we did this recording, I was getting in the mindset. I was watching some uh, some videos of folks, you know, living aboard. And uh, <laughs> one of the guys, you know, uh, bought like a 1975 boat and, you know, restored it. It looked brand new. Uh, I mean, that's uh, that's an option, too. But uh, uh, obviously, you know, you'll have to do what uh, do what you can do uh, if this is something you're interested in pursuing. Yeah, such such would seem to be the case. All right. So uh, uh, I guess let's uh, that was all I had there for uh, for excerpts. Rio talked about it. You know, he talked about sailboating quite a bit. Uh, compared to other things he talked about, where you you know mentioned it in passing, pretty much. Um, and yeah, we also had a couple of additional excerpts from you know the uh, the newly uh, arrived publication. So let's begin to close out here. Uh, I think the first and most important thing here is to acknowledge once again that you can overlap these strategies like all hell. Uh, like for example, country shopping, uh, international mobility, plus minimal sailboating, plus intentional community. You have intentional community out on the water, and you could country shop. Uh, you know, if you, if you, if you wanted to spend a couple months, you know, off land for some reason, maybe you guys want to, I don't know, maybe it's your anniversary month with your woman or something or your man and you guys decide to, you know, go to the, uh, go to the Bahamas and, uh, you know, spend a month or two there or whatever. Uh, I mean, you could combine, you can combine, uh, you know, a lot of different things into, uh, uh, into your, I guess, minimal sailboating. Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, kind of mix and match and, you know, combining certain things that can be combined can make it, you know, one potent, uh, you know, (laughs) the tactical implications in terms of its effectiveness can be kind of like a force multiplier, right? So instead of just doing one thing, if you combine it with two two or three other things that kind of mesh nicely together, then then they're uh, more effective together than than they would be uh, done separately, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's 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 yeah, certainly true, certainly true, and just 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 even hypothesizing that scenario right now, you know, being able to country shop and, and you know be out on a sailboat, and uh, you know even have some like-minded fo- like minded folks out there on the ocean, you know, 
That seems like a hell of a life. <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> it does. really does. Seems seems like one, you know, 95% of the time free from coercion. Uh, you know, free from even the threat of coercion, uh, rather. Uh, but, you know, anytime, uh, you know, anytime uh, you're in the state of Servile Society and an owned house on the public roads Ugh. and all that stuff, you're very vulnerable. You you really are. But out there in the ocean, I you know, it's, it's, it's almost too hard to imagine, man. It really is. Yeah, yeah. And not being under threat of coercion when I try to, you know, pursue financial independence would certainly be uh, a great improvement and would definitely be the newer. Right, right. Uh, so, so I guess I guess one other um, I've, I've mentioned this you know multiple times, but uh, you know throughout uh, you know season one and season two, probably just season two more primarily, but advance, advancements in technology make this strategy so much more practical. It's it's crazy how much technology really really does you know kind of enable this uh, this this form of direct action or this uh, this strategy for Vanu. Uh, you consider you know things like electricity, like solar panels exist now. They didn't back then. Uh, I mean, there's there's also uh, I mean there, there there are ways to you know uh, obviously you can have generators and alternators and all that sort of stuff too. Um, there's there there are ways to you know get uh, get your power out there on the boat. That's a pretty huge one. Uh, and I mean you're you're not gonna need a, a whole lot of heat and air conditioning if any out there. I don't think anyone would need to. Because um, as Bob explained it, uh, Bob from the Marinia Project, he uh, he explained it as uh, you know since you're like if you're out there in the, out there in the middle of the ocean, the land doesn't absorb the heat, so um, it's actually you know cooler, <laughs> but the sun is a lot more you know vicious. So you, it, it may feel cooler, but you'll get a lot more sunburned. Is kind of the way that he explained it. So you won't need heat and air conditioning, as far as I understand it. Um, you know, so to power your if if you're gonna if if you have a uh, internationally mobile business like a podcast or something along those lines. Uh, I mean, there are ways to get around that too. Uh, actually, I haven't even mentioned this part yet. I've, I guess I should since I, mentioned, since I mentioned that. But if you have like an internationally mobile business, and um, you can you know work from anywhere, I mean that's that's great. <laughs> that's, that's that's obviously great. But then gets into the realm of well, how do you acquire internet? The easiest way would be uh, obviously if if um, you you know return to port, you know. Um, once a month or twice a month, you could just, you know, hop on the Wi-Fi there and, uh, you know, upload all your content at once. Or one great thing about WordPress, I'm sure other platforms have this too, is you can actually schedule the posts out. So um, you could, you know, you have like, you know, eight pieces of content for that month and then just schedule them for like a week ahead. And then by the time you get back to port, your last one's done and you can schedule some more. Then you could also, you know, you could obviously hire somebody on the other side or some, or help. If I did this, Kyle would do this for me, I'm sure. You know, just you know, go on fascist book and just, you know, just share it around on on facebook pages and groups and such um that would be one way to do it the other way is to get yourself satellite internet and uh if you aren't rich <laughs> well rich is subjective right mm -hmm. uh, if you're an extremely wealthy person uh then this is not going to be an option for you let me explain why <laughs> all right so for satellite internet out there on the ocean global coverage except in the uh the arctic regions i guess or the polar regions uh polar regions is the right way to put it uh except for the polar regions so if you're going to do any sailing around uh, Antarctica or the Arctic Circle, it's not, you're not going to get service. I'm sorry. I don't know what you're doing out there anyways. Uh, unless you're dealing with John Fisher recommended. And if you are, then, you know, I salute you and I don't know how you're listening to this podcast. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, okay, so satellite internet and phone. So for, uh, this is from Ground Control. You can't find this stuff. I looked on Amazon and eBay, both sites, you know, before the show. This stuff is highly specialized. You have to go, like, through these sorts of, you have to go through their website. So for your 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 ground base, 150 kilobytes per second speed. That's I think double the speed of dial-up internet. Like it's slow. It's I, I don't know exactly. It's slow as hell. So for your Sailor FB150, for just you know the satellite phone and you know the modem or router and uh, the little ball that'll go you know on the ship to get signal, five thousand one hundred dollars for their base rate package, and that's not counting the monthly monthly payments. <laughs> Ridiculous. Now, if you want to go with our Sailor FP500, $13,499, 432, uh, 432 kilobytes per second speed. So you're not even, you're just uh, just under three times the amount of speed from that first one, and you're paying almost three grand more. Uh, so it gets quite expensive. So if you want, if you want, you know, constant internet out there, uh, yeah, unless you're very, unless, you know, you can drop, you know, five grand and not care about it, uh, it's not an option. 
So, uh, so, so here are your options on that point. <laughs> is uh, you know, you can get uh, the the contiguous zone, you know, within like the 25, uh, uh, 24 nautical, 27 miles mark. And uh, you could just, uh, you know, hopefully, if uh, if the weather's clear, if it's a, if it's a nice day out, you might be able to pull some signal from the uh, terrestrial antennas. And if not, then uh, like I said, you know, just uh, get content done, start scheduling it out, you know, at a later date. And uh, then, you know, just use Wi-Fi when you have it available. That's the very, that's the much more economical uh, way to do so. And I, I imagine if uh, if Rayo were alive and, uh, you know, he was uh, looking at, uh, you know, the options for, uh, you know, if he was alive using the Internet and he looked at some of these options, uh, you know, I think he would have, uh, you know, probably, you know, probably died <laughs> for how much some of this shit costs. Yeah, well, that's 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 definitely a good initial look at that. And just to provide a counterpoint to that, which and I think this would be good for a season three episode is really kind of more of a crypto anarchist focus on basically like mobile Internet or what some people would call pirate Internet is really looking at bo both the technological condition of and the financial cost as well. Um, of of whatever uh, having some sort if if it's even possible to even have internet connection even slightly off the grid, um, I'm personally aware of a few home uh, off grid homesteaders who are experimenting with ar what's arguably much more affordable satellite internet and you know the cost can get down. Some of them have reported, and I haven't had a chance to double check on this, but some of them have tentatively reported like overall costs of like running it per month, not the setup costs, but the maintenance costs of like $75 a month. Um, that's, that's, that's not too bad. That's not too bad because your monthly service plan with fleet broadband for your uh, satellite internet on the ocean, the very minimal, very minimal. And you're told you're going to be paying a lot of overages if you use this amount, mm -hmm. $700 a month. Well, also consider one thing too. The off grid homesteaders are still on land versus yeah yeah it's just it's just the, the the companies don't have an incentive to actually put service out there because there's no one living there really right uh, it's not worth their money yeah so they so yeah they're, they're stuck with the satellite that's the same way as with uh as, as of right now uh with the homestead i'm going to move into they, they just recently put in you know city water mm -hmm. or town water it's not a city um i don't know why they call it city water it's town of 50 pe town of 50 people is not a city <laughs> uh but they, they finally got you know town water out there we'll call it what it is it's town water um but uh but yeah i mean that the internet out there it's it's so far away from their central hub that the internet speed is just it might actually be slower than what these satellites uh internet <laughs> rates are uh in all honesty uh so yeah i know exactly what you mean you know as, 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 as far as that i'm gonna be dealing with that same thing i'll have to pay some satellite i'll, I'll have to pay for satellite internet that's what i have to do mm, well I would just say this. I mean, maybe this would be better as a season three episode going into more detail about that kind of thing. But, yeah, there's different attempts by by some of the off gridders to try and get to still use satellite Internet, but get it the cost down to where it's it's more affordable than not. So instead of dealing like with hundreds and or even thousands of dollars, it's more like at most a couple hundred in setup. And then you're pretty much talking no more than one hundred dollars per month kind of thing to where it's starting to rival the costs of of people like living, you know, on the grid of people living in the cities, people living in an apartment like I am currently, unfortunately, and so forth, um, which I think is a worthwhile endeavor so that, you know, the more options people have, the better it is. What I don't know is whether satellite Internet on land is noticeably different from satellite Internet, um, you know, several miles out on the water. And it very well may be. Also consider, too, at Rayo, one of the Rayo quotes you, you mentioned earlier about how salt water is very corrosive. Well, would that affect the, the, the satellite Internet equipment? So would the off-gridders on the land be in a better position to kind of do that relative to their uh, minimalist sailboating uh, counterparts, uh, in a sense, where they don't have to deal with the salt corrosion on their equipment? So, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. I, I would assume... I would assume that they, that uh, you know that uh, that satellite it's 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 pretty much a, like it's a round orb is what it is. So it's you know 360, 360 degrees anywhere you are on Earth except in the polar regions you have the same exact service as you'd have anywhere else. Um, so I don't know. Um, I, I'd imagine they'd mount it in a place where it'd be you know less likely to become corroded. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, that that would be yeah that's an expensive piece of equipment to you know have uh, some corrosion by salt water right you know five grand like you have to replace it after five years for, for for that corrosion you know another five grand dropped mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, I don't know if it costs that much, but it, uh, I don't know. Either way, that that is a good that is a good uh, a good a good point to bring up as far as comparisons. Yeah, and so that's that's kind of what's kind of interesting here is you know is it possible to recreate uh, the amenities that people are used to in the cities and recreate them out in non city areas, whether it be an off grid homestead or living full time, doing the minimalist sailboating thing, or even other types of lifestyles and living environments and so forth. And that's that's kind of an interesting question to try and answer, at least uh, at least in this, uh, and especially as we're doing in this episode in a very overview way, uh, kind of looking at a, at a lot of different things and so forth. But um, I don't know, man. Yeah, I, I will I will say if you're looking to stream Netflix out there in the open ocean, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. Hell, even if you're downloading a podcast, I probably I, I wouldn't I still wouldn't recommend it. I mean, it's not going to be worth it. I mean, it's it's like eleven thirty five like eleven dollars and thirty five cents for like. You know, mega, like it, it's expensive. It's ridiculously expensive for data. Uh, so if you do want to, like, although I don't know why you'd be watching Netflix if you're on the open ocean anyways. But hey, if you want to, you know, just make sure you download that stuff, you know, locally. And then, you know, just use your power, your local power on your boat. Uh, but uh, yeah, this, this, stuff gets, this, this stuff gets expensive, man. Uh, it, it really, it really does. But uh, you, you mentioned in pre-show something about, um, you know, space steading. Uh, would you like to, uh, to touch upon that, uh, you know, real quick? Yeah, sure. I mean, something I've kind of noticed is that in regards to the difficulty of living in certain types of environments relative to others, that there are people who are interested in living in space and exploring space, maybe even colonizing some elements of space, usually other planets. And that's all well and good. Um, I would just say this. In a lot of ways, you could compare minimalist sailboating as a easier version of space exploration in the sense that you're still dealing with like confined spaces uh but at least you have air and that is something i don't think a lot of people think of when they're endorsing things like mars one or other types of ventures and experiments of whatever kind is it's kind of like well if you ain't willing to go sailboating then why are you trying to go up into space you know just saying yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, yeah, that's that's definitely a good point. I had something, but might have uh, you know, might have uh, escaped my mind. Uh, but uh, but yeah, you know, I I I mean, obviously, you know, they're they're as we've discussed with uh, you know, meantime to harassment and uh, you know, competency. Uh, I mean, the the way that she put it is, if you can't uh, if you can't walk a mile, then why would we we expect you to run a marathon? Yeah, uh, it's kind of kind of the the way that she typically put it, and I think that's good. I mean, if if you know, space setting is so far out there. Uh, you know, I, I still think it's quite a ways out there. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen, you know, anytime soon. Maybe in our lifetime. I hope in our life. I hope we can have some private space exploration. Uh, you know, hopefully, you know, I can I can do that before I die. That'd be pretty cool. But um, yeah, as far as uh, <laughs> as far as competency, uh, yeah, sailboating is a little uh, easier than uh, you know, spacecraft. Uh, in addition to that, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you getting a sailboat and going and floating around is going to raise less attention than if you launch a rocket into fucking space. Um, so the activity is a little different there, right? Uh, when you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, raising your activity, but also, you know, uh, raising or keeping the same, your competency. Uh, yeah, you're going to draw a little more attention launching a spacecraft into space. Well, uh, in terms of like the, the radar, uh, by different governments, I mean, sure. I mean, of course there was, of course, just to give kind of a, a little bit of a preview on, on maybe a topic, maybe more appropriate for LUA radio. I mean, there are different ways of getting into space. It doesn't have to be straightly vertical. You can also kind of do like a slingshot type method where you actually use uh, centrifugal force and the curvature of the earth to actually use less energy and actually to, in order to achieve as an escape velocity and actually, you know, not get pulled in by gravity and fall down. Uh, but that's getting a little bit technical. Um, but suffice it to say, man, yeah, I, I, I think that people who talk about, you know, going into space and either exploring or colonizing or whatever they're interested in, hell, even mining, there's all sorts of rare materials on like asteroids and other planets and stuff that a lot of the drones, but NASA's drones and all that have, have found or whatever. Um, so there's also like profitable ventures that are that are uh, at least tentatively possible. Um, but the, the main issue is survivability right now. And as far as those kind of things go, and I think that minimalist sailboating can give people who are interested in exploring space a a lighter taste 
of how truly difficult it is to even get into outer space, much less anything else like colonization or, or whatever. So I think I think minimalist sailboating can kind of serve d different functions. It can give you, it has the potential to make you more invulnerable to coercion now, but it also serves as a sort of practical laboratory that is a nicer, more somewhat more cuddlier version of actually uh, coloniza uh, of space exploration and colonization, quite frankly, because you have air. Right, right, yeah, yeah. And that, that's, you know, that's something, that's why I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting into uh, Vaughnwing in cities, because some people just don't want to do the wilderness Vaughnwing thing. Uh, you know, the wilderness Vaughnwing is easier for a lot of reasons, and the Vaughnwing in cities is easier for a lot of reasons. Um, but, you know, it's, it's good to, you know, good to have options. Uh, available to to the listeners here, but since we were talking about, uh, I was talking about competency and activity. I wonder where minimalist sailboating would fall in terms of MTH, and maybe we should have done this for the. Um, oh man, well I guess for the uh, <laughs> for 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 all of the uh, localized areas of liberty except for intentional communities, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, that that sounds right. That sounds right. Um, those would all be you know very high level you know MTH you know not not very feasible. Um, but uh, as far as minimal sailboating, where do you think that falls in terms of MTH? Well, as um, I think it would be fair to say that depending on the size of the sailboat, it would either most likely be either sea level or D level Vanu. Um, I mean, pretty much we're talking about the equivalent of either van dwelling, and then the sailboat would just be the water boat version of van dwelling, or the sailboat might be large enough to where it's more like living in a tiny home. And so, like, if it's just, like, a larger John boat, probably more like sea level Vanu, but if it's more like a sailboat, arguably like that footage we watched of, like, those different right. couples, I personally am suggesting that might be more D-level because the way, I mean, even even the videographer was kind of comparing... Uh, those sailboats to the other tiny homes, which is what her main focus is, and, and focusing on, like, alternative shelters and all that, but really, like, homes, homes, not living in a van, but a home. And that's all D-level stuff. Um, if you were to have it be more as a practical impediment to coercion and such. So that's what I'm kind of thinking, is that depending on the size of the sailboat and its construction and so forth, C or D-level Vanu. So it's well within the grasp of people to kind of go off and do on their own. And for people who are not familiar with MTH, please uh, look at our Season 1 episode on Mean Time to Harassment. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think I would agree with you. I think I would agree with you there. Um, I, I would, yeah, hmm. Yeah, I would, I would, I would say more so. Yeah, it's, I'd say more so sea level, honestly. Uh, so the tiny home, you know, a lot of those, even even though they are tiny, you know, they're they're good for a lot of reasons. You know, they are permanent autonomous homes. Uh, you know, living in a van is obviously, you know, uh, very mobile, and uh, you know, sailboating is very mobile. So, I, I, yeah, I guess CR, CRD is probably yeah that 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 seems that seems pretty fair. Yeah, because it's it's not easy to do. Like, it, I mean. Uh, that it takes a lot less capital investment than some, some of the other strategies we've covered, and uh, but but it does take some technical know-how. Uh, you've got to yeah, as I, as I said previously, you've got to learn how to navigate the ocean. You've got to learn how to operate a sailboat. You got to learn all the maintenance, the repairs. Uh, unless you're going to outsource that, but that's going to cost a lot of money. You might you might you'll probably be better off doing it yourself unless you have that disposable income. Uh, so I mean yeah, there there is uh, yeah there there is that, that kind of, there's that complicated aspect there, right? Yeah, I, I, I suppose so. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, with a sailboat, you're going to be mobile. So perhaps you are right about sea level Vanu, at least in some sense. Um, although there are the tiny it, it, houses. It would be, it would be, a, it would be a lot harder um, to to conceal and you know, conceal and you know deception for a for a tiny home considered to be in a stationary location. But I, yeah, there are there are tiny homes which are mobile. And those aren't kind of factored into that. So those, <laughs> I think those would be more sea level Vani, like if it's the tiny home that you tow behind you to wherever you want to park. Yeah. That would be sea level, yeah. But if it's going to be a stationary fixed location where the bludgies know where to harass you, you're going to have to be better at concealment and deception, uh, and therefore it'll be a higher level of uh, mean time to harassment. I think that's fair to say, yeah. Okay, very good. So I guess one other... And I've kind of already alluded to this a, a couple of times, but... I'll do a little comparing, comparing and contrasting, kind of like what Rayo did. Only, you know, regarding competency again. Um, it, you know, again, it's it's far more difficult to prepare for living aboard uh, uh, on a boat uh, in the ocean. Uh, you know, 
re regarding you know van nomadism uh we all know how to like we all know how to drive we've been doing it for a long time right uh you know some longer than others but uh you know it, it becomes second nature uh so if, if uh, you decide to pursue van nomadism then you don't have to you know learn how to drive a car uh you don't have to uh you know learn the uh the the, the uh, rules of the road i think they called it in uh in driver's ed class uh you have like you, you you're you're already familiar with those things which all you have to really do after that is figure out okay where am i going to park to sleep and how often do i have to move how do i avoid the blood cheese how do i avoid this harassment uh etc cetera, etc cetera. oh the boat again i've already laid out the, the the complications there not even complications just you know obstacles to overcome they're a little more profound than just that it's a whole new way of life uh for a lot of people so i wanted to kind of lay that out there uh, uh real quick I think you're right. I think you're right because when people were growing up, they or their parents uh, or just family members or just people around them either talked about cars, used cars, they were passengers in cars well before they were ever drivers and so forth, right? It, it's, it's like part of the culture. Mm -hmm. um, not Relatively speaking, not that many people grew up with boats, were passengers in boats, were boating around or sailing around to other places uh, to go do chores, they were using cars. So I think in terms of like the inventions of one mode of transportation versus another, the familiarity was, really takes place during childhood. I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, you know, there's car seats for children, right? Well, how many uh, car seat equivalents are there for people on boats, you know? <laughs> It's a called it's called a life jacket. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, but you're supposed to wear a life jacket anyway on a boat. But anyway, uh, even if you're not a child. But yes, point point taken, right? Um, there's already much more of a servile society friendly market uh, of sorts with with like accoutrements with cars re relative to boats and so forth. Um, and I, and I think that's just kind of par for the course. Uh, for a lot of reasons, some historical, others more economic, and others even yet more purely political in terms of subsidies to you know the big uh, you know the big car industry and so forth, like like uh, General Motors and Ford and you know the the other companies in the Rust Belt. Um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not aware of the government subsidizing any of the uh, the industry of people who uh, build boats and such. I don't think that even is a fascist type industry where it's subsidized. I don't think that exists. Uh, so yeah, I think that that might also drive it to where perhaps it's much more genuinely free market or closer to it, I guess. Um, I think there's that as yeah. well. Yeah, cer certainly less government interference, certainly less government interference. And you know, that's, that's great. And once you get out of the international, international waters, oh boy, there ain't no rules. Hold on. <laughs> Don't violate person property. You'll be all right. Uh, but, uh, uh so, so Kyle, uh, I guess if, if you had to kind of, you know, postulate going into the future this is much like what Rayo used to do as, as far as uh as, as far as like areas of study and research but okay so kyle uh, i guess is, is there anything else you anything else you'd like to uh, leave the listeners with uh before before you know really you know close this out i would really just say do your own due diligence learn the uh nuts and bolts and of it and and so forth and if you come across anything interesting again uh my email address is kyle at vanupodcast.com your shane is shane at vanupodcast.com and let us know if you find anything that can kind of gets more into the nitty-gritty whether it's legal interstices whether it's more the capital investment required uh, of, of one kind or another whether it's more technical such as well you may consider you know this version of a boat versus that version of a boat and and so forth i mean just just kind of let us know uh, you know help us prepare for those uh upcoming episodes in in a sense especially those of you who have been boating before or better yet are minimalist boating now and living full-time in your boats as you listen to this uh kind of overview of of the entire thing and kind of make suggestions and give us you know some some uh some leads some clues as to uh kind of figuring out uh, some of the nuance and minutia and sorts and that that would definitely be really appreciated uh because obviously we're we're trying to kind of kind of uh giving this information out to people who are interested in direct action who come from a more anti-political uh, perspective and are really just trying to make lifestyle changes so that they don't have to deal with uh, the public criminals, as it were. Yes, yes. And, and this is just as when Ray was doing this. Um, and obviously Kyle, Kyle and I aren't, aren't Van Nomad, we aren't, we aren't Van Nomads or we aren't, you know, doing Wilderness Fawny right now. But if you look back at the publications and, you, and, and what's, you know, Ray presented these ideas and he wanted feedback from from his readers. He wanted feedback on what they were doing, what was working, what was not working. And we want that same sort of thing, you know, uh, uh, from you guys. Are you trying something that's um, 
Are you are you trying one of these methods? Uh, do you have some success stories? Some oh, this was a giant failure. No one do this. Let us know, please. <laughs> you know, we we we'd certainly love to hear. You know, uh, from from any of you that are are doing some of these uh, these sorts of things. And if you aren't. Uh, you know, obviously you can send us questions, suggestions, ideas, uh, anything like that. We, we'd certainly love to, you know, get feedback from you guys. And also we'd love for you guys to help us produce a podcast. Uh, right, Kyle? So, um, or at least give it, or at least give us clues and then we'll do the, the heavy lifting on the research right, and such, right. but at least kind of point us and like, like where would the source material be for, uh, say, you know, which set of laws of which government entity, or where would we look for statistics or, or other more financial information in terms of this particular boat costs X amount versus that other type of boat, which costs Y amount. And maybe the, maybe the second boat is more affordable than the first boat and so forth or whatever else, or maybe it's more of a trade-off type thing do you want more speed or do you want more storage um uh, room on the bow which means uh which means something else gets reduced and so forth so like all those 20 million different considerations and all that in terms of original sources would definitely be uh greatly appreciated and would lead to uh you know better quality content in terms of pointing out uh like what people need to know in order to get started on on minimalist sailboating in in more uh, a step-by-step -step manner Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So you know, I've said it before. I'll say it again. You know, I, I really do think, you know, what uh, Freedom Pioneers will, will inevitably set sail for sunnier waters. So uh, even if it's not, even if, even if this episode and, and what Rayo had to say is not valuable to you now, uh, and even what we, even if what we say in season three, you know, developing, developing upon this even further than we have this evening, uh, this will be a highly valuable episode to you. Uh, and all of this content will be, will be highly valuable, whether it's Rayo or whether it's us talking or whatever. Um, because I, I really do believe, you know, as, as governments become more tyrannical, and they will, I mean, why would they stop? <laughs> why would they stop their expropriation? Uh, I, I really do think the, the, the next logical step is the open ocean. And then, uh, you know, once the technology is there, then maybe it'll be space setting as well. But, uh, but for right now, we've got, uh, we, we've got a, a very plausible option, uh, you know, ahead of us. Uh, and that is uh, minimal sailboating, as well as all the, all the other solutions that that represented. But this one being, uh, this episode being on minimal sailboating. So, uh, if you haven't already, make sure to check out the website, vonnypodcast.com. While you're there, please pick up a free copy of Rayo's book in PDF or audiobook format. Also, it takes a lot for this podcast to come together, uh, not to mention the hours and hours it will take uh, Kyle and I to digitize Vonny Life March 1973, among other things that we've got going on. Uh, so for that reason, we would certainly appreciate any financial assistance you'd be able to toss our way. Uh, we accept PayPal, Bitcoin, altcoins, and you get rewarded for your support through Patreon. Uh, rewards include a special monthly email newsletter from Kyle, a monthly private Skype audio video chat with us about Vanu, uh, and even Vanu merchandise if we reach our first goal. Uh, and, and also, too, I mean, we, we talked about those Patreon episode, episodes early, uh, Kyle, regarding this uh, this new publication. Uh, you know, that'd be another very, uh, very good way to, uh, to, to uh, get connected there. Uh, that would be uh, patreon.com forward slash Vanu. As always, make sure to share the podcast around with those that may be interested, and uh, that's all we have for you. We'll talk to you next week.